The recession that everybody's been waiting for isn't coming, hasn't come. We are investing into a slowing economy. Consumers kind of moving towards the front end, institutional going towards the long end. We think the Fed is going to keep rates higher for longer. The risks are that they don't even cut this year, they start to cut next year. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. You be Jim Nance, I'll be Nick Faldo. 15th hole. Oh, kill. We are here with Michael Block. 151 yards out. He's reaching for a seven eye here, Jim. Look at that. TK, what a shot. Outstanding. Beautiful. Let's listen to the crowd at Oak Hill. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant, it was Bramo. spectacular. Thanks for getting involved. It was spe- for me, for God me, Jai, it was, it was, it was, you know, for those of you international are going, where did they wake up today? This is golf in America over the weekend, and it was a club that I have the fondest what memories a story. of caddying there. What a story, and Michael Blow. It just Blow. kept getting better and better. That's just awesome. I don't think I've ever seen a hole-in-one like that, TK. No, just straight never, into the cup. never seen straight it. Straight into the cup. I'm told mm. that the club throw from California was charging $150 an hour right. for lessons, and he picked up $288,000 over the weekend. And in this age of media, you know, what we try to do here every day is try to be understated about the markets. I just thought the way CBS... Did it understated for, you know, the rain on Saturday. You know, it goes back to Rochester. There's July and winter, and that's it. Just awesome. Just awesome. <clears throat> we great. won't be doing that again. Don't worry. From New York City this morning, yeah, good morning. worked. Good morning. <laughs> we'll practice next time. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bramitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Uh, Equity futures on the S&P, slightly negative. The back and forth on the debt ceiling debate. Debt ceiling talks on, <clears throat> off, not so yeah. good. Good, OK, doing all right. TK, we get another round of it a little bit later yes, today. Is there president leaving on a jet plane? He's coming back home. Emory Horton is in Tokyo and will brief us on a returning Biden to Washington. What I would focus on, John, is I believe futures right now are 4201.75 on SPX. There's lots of distractions this morning away from a market on a tear. Let's get some quotes for you from Kevin McCarthy, the Speaker of the House, speaking to Fox over the weekend. It seems as though he wants default more than he wants a deal, talking about the president. The president snapping back, Bramo, and ultimately saying it's time for the other side to move from their extreme positions. Much of what they've already proposed is simply, quite frankly, unacceptable. That was the weekend. I have some bad news for everyone. We're going to be doing this all week long because basically it's not going to get better until it gets worse. And that's basically what everyone's been saying. And it seems like that's being borne out because right now, the fact that we heard (laughs) some rhetoric, we heard a walkout from the GOP of the weekend, McCarthy coming out with some pretty fiery rhetoric. And then all of a sudden they're meeting again today and constructive tones moving forward. President Biden signaling the all clear. I like what Vallier said in this morning note, Greg Vallier, AGF, he said it was a bad, inconclusive weekend. And John, the question is on a Monday morning, what's the countdown to when they run out of money? I'm unclear on this. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says the clock is ticking. The <coughs> countdown starts now. And oh, she it's ticking, thinks, absolutely. She doubts whether we can get to the middle of June. At the same time, though, yields are higher. The equity market's breaking out. Is this a true and real breakout? Two pieces of pushback this morning yes. already. One from Miss Love Mateka of JP Morgan TK. Another from Mike Wilson of Morgan Stanley. You might say the usual suspects, but ultimately there is some pushback out there. This is the debate that's out there. We're going to bring it to you all week, folks. I'm looking forward to that. I would say one thing globally, which folds into Mike Wilson's uh, caution, is the first chart I looked at today was London Copper. And I'm sorry, it is south. And the Bloomberg Commodity Index, BCOM, is south. It's down 26% from the middle of last year peak. Copper does not validate any cyclical <clears throat> enthusiasm about yeah. the global economy right now. It's been making new lows for the year over the last couple of weeks. Let's switch through the price action for you on the equity market on the S&P 500. Slightly negative, getting your week started on the S&P. Just a bit softer. Yields a little bit lower. Before today, though, six consecutive days of yields climbing higher, both on a two-year, Lisa, on a 10-year, too. Your 10-year right now, 365.74. Well, we did hear from Fed Chair Jay Powell on Friday some indication that he might be ready for a pause and similar uh, rhetoric out of Neil Kashkari uh, in the Wall Street Journal. Today, President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy are resuming talks. Perhaps we'll get more tea leaves that will then be reversed by tomorrow. Uh, On Wednesday, we get NVIDIA reporting earnings after the bell. This, to me, may be one of the key moments of the week because of all the artificial intelligence kind of hype that we've been seeing. NVIDIA shares year-to-date are up about 113 percent, so a huge part of the gain. Also interesting in light of the Micron news with China over the weekend. We'll get to that, but basically China banning imports 
from Micron saying it didn't pass the sniff test when it came to national security. And this week on the data front, we have global flash, uh, flash PMIs tomorrow, FOMC meeting minutes on Wednesday. And this to me is key. On Friday, <clears throat> we get PCE inflation and you Mish survey, basically the forward looking projections for inflation. The PCE is not expected to go down at all. How do we deal with this idea of core PCE that is sticky around 4.6%? How does the Fed deal with that? It's going to be a big question for the Federal Reserve. More Fed speak through the week. Can hardly wait for that. So many Fed speakers. Interesting interview with Neil Kashgari of the Minneapolis Fed as well with the Wall Street Journal over the weekend. We'll pick up on some of those comments in a moment. Joining us now to start the week, good friend of this program, good friend of ours, Luke Cower, Asset Allocation Strategist at UBS Asset Management. Luke, good morning to you, buddy. As always, let's start here. Are we on the brink of a breakout? What are you and the team saying over at UBS? So right now, this kind of, I would say, connects to what Ms. Abramovitz was saying about the, the debt ceiling agreement or lack thereof. It's that, uh, you know, with equities in a, about the near the top of a seven month range, uh, it's it's really difficult to see that you know, now before this being solved, being the uh, being the proper time for a for a real true genuine breakout. And, you know, with this agreement uh, and it was alluded to effectively in the intro, uh, if this is a if this is a real battle, if this is a real war between the two sides, you got to come out of it with some blood and scars. And from what we saw early last week, talks were almost going too well heading into Friday. So kind of not a uh, surprise to us to see that backpedal and for us to really uh, test the the urgency of both sides as we approach a an unknown X date and an unknown, you know, true X date thereafter. Uh, look, you've got the advantage of a terrific research combine, and I'd love to know the ambiguity and which way you tilt. And if inflation is sticky, I think that means nominal GDP is sticky and revenues are better than good at corporations. Or if inflation is sticky, do we slow down? Which way does UBS tilt? Well, so far, I think the the jury would suggest a, more the latter, right? That there's that a certain amount of pricing power has accrued to corporates, and that's the part of inflation that will be you know relatively sticky, along with you know maybe wage growth a little above uh, above the kind of previous cycle's trend. I think the kind of idea that profit margins have stabilized at a high level with inflation stabilizing kind of at a high level would support this. But I, I do think that right now we, we do have to you know, have a lot of humility about what that last mile of inflation down looks like, uh, because most likely, in our view, it will be driven by an economic contraction at some point in the future, certainly not in our base case for 2023. But it's, it's highly likely that if we get to kind of a, a steady state run rate for inflation without the labor market cracking, that that's still going to be a rate that's, you know, above the, the 2% uh, target right now. Once upon a time, big tech used to be interest rate sensitive, and a lot of people have come out and said this time is different. And actually, now they've somehow divorced themselves from the interest rate cycle that even if rates don't go down, they will still do well. Do you buy into the whole artificial intelligence hype? Do you think it's perhaps uh, a bit overplayed? How much are you really looking to the earnings this week to give you a sense on that? One thing that, you know, we, we think about AI, obviously very, very exciting technology, something that, uh, you know, we, we can use in our day to day, something that, you know, you can see some modest efficiency improvements in, in how you operate now, no matter what kind of business you are. Uh, it's very unclear the extent to which uh, that is is going to drive, you know, a another huge leg of outsized profit growth for these players in the kind of tactical investment horizon. Is it something, you know, that has certainly helped boost multiples? Uh, yes, are, are multiples, you know, on the elevated range uh, relative to the rest of the market? Yes, even more so. So from that perspective, um, unless you were, you know, getting in uh, a lot earlier based on the AI thesis, it doesn't seem to us that, you know, now is really the time to be to be leaping on into some of those names that have really benefited the most in some of those sectors that have really benefited the most from uh, from this recent trend. So if you're constructive, where is leadership going to come from in light of the debt ceiling, in light of U.S.-China tensions, and in light of the fact that it can't necessarily come that much more under your thesis from artificial intelligence related tech stocks? Well, certainly at the headline level for equity is not uh, not that constructive. Uh, what we do think is that you know the stronger nominal growth environment is something that is going to underpin earnings for a time. But with you know equities quite expensive at the headline level, you know, our view has been that uh, you know if if things are going nowhere in stocks for seven months, what you could have been doing is is clipping coupons and credit, and that's something where you're getting paid to wait. The uh, in in the stock market, you really haven't been getting paid to wait unless you get you know, a pretty decent margin of safety and are getting in at the bottom of the range. So that's still more our view that right. uh, the. 
the implied yield, implied carry you're getting in equities isn't nearly good enough to kind of compensate for the implied yield you're you're getting in, uh, in credit right now. Look, we got to run here. We got some breaking news. But uh, got Mark Halfley from London emails in and he says, you know, we're looking at the next Maple Leafs, Toronto Maple Leafs general manager, and there's Pridham, there's Gilman, or there's Kawa. How valuable? How valuable are you if the Leafs need you? <laughs> I, I would say uh, I'm certainly not an upgrade on Kyle Dubas, so I'm, I'm part of the long <laughs> list that wouldn't be an upgrade. So from that perspective, I'm available. Luke, thanks so much. You know, John, one this, of the best. This Thank is you, so important. They beat Tampa Bay, which no one expected. The Leafs crushed the reigning champions, and then boom, Florida. Goodbye. You've got to explain to everybody, Tom, how Tampa has a good ice hockey team. I mean, I was uh, trying, trying to translate well, that to people last time. Exactly. Like, this makes, just does not make any make sense. No Jeff, sense. Jeffrey Vinnick was at Fidelity, and he was really, really good. And one day Jeffrey Vinnick left off a of zero coupon bond uh, ballet, and he really, you know, he bounced around. He had did this, did this as a hitter, and then all of a sudden he built a hockey team in Tampa. Amazing. And that's what you do when you're a boy from Boston. You go down to Tampa and build it out, and he did it. For better weather. Yeah. Luke Cower, thank you, sir, of UBS Asset <clears throat> Management. As we're having this conversation about maybe breaking out in the equity market, the challenges, the headwinds to growth, the debt ceiling debate, JP Morgan's upgrading its outlook, Bramo, in their investor day. <clears throat> Upgrading the outlook. To me, this is going to be one of the big questions. How do they upgrade the outlook, capture greater profitability as they dominate the industry to such a degree that a lot of people are wondering how much more can they acquire in light of <coughs> Janet Yellen on Friday saying that there may have to be more roll-ups within the banking sector. I mean, again, at what point does their size and dominance and success become a liability now that they have 13 percent of all deposits in this country? And this is JP Morgan this morning. We're upgrading our outlook. Some, yeah, exactly. We're exactly. Upgrading our That's outlook, exactly. Just it. sort of hiding behind one hand. They're, they both, well, their the profits. I think we've been very good about this in the earnings derby when it comes out. Most of these banks, including, as I say, the uh, the fifth bank of the United States, J.P. Morgan and Bank of America combined, they're hiding how much money they're making. That's we are a fact. Upgrading yeah. our outlook this morning. Yes, we don't um, know. Which, Golf you know, voice. Don't let's don't. <laughs> coming across the green we, and upgrading their outlook. It's got about 150 yards hey, out. Chase. Chase had terrific branding. For seven Michael nine. Block walking up the 15th and in the background for free on the white tent. It says Chase or whatever. It's I mean, cool. the ball it's, branding it's what you pay for. Great. It's what you pay yeah. for. <clears throat> Equities right now unchanged on the S&P in the next hour. Sharon Bell of Goldman Sachs. you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Ukraine reported damage to dozens of buildings and vehicles in the southern city of Dnipro after another barrage of Russian missiles overnight. Ukrainian forces say they managed to shoot down four of the 16 missiles launched, as well as 20 drones. President Vladimir Zelensky is expected to return to Kyiv after attending the Group of Seven summit in Japan, where he suggested Russian forces are losing control of the eastern city of Bakhmut after months of fighting. UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is arriving back from the Group of Seven summit, facing yet another cabinet scandal and Conservative Party finger pointing over soaring migration numbers. At the center of both issues is Home Secretary Swella Braverman, an advocate of cutting back immigration who has come under fire for a possible violation of ministerial rules relating to her handling of the speeding ticket last year. President Biden and Republican House Speaker Kevin McCarthy are set to meet today for talks on averting a catastrophic U.S. default as time runs short and key differences remain. Negotiations have been whipsawed between progress and deadlock for days as the two sides simultaneously grapple for political advantage and a deal. Handpicked negotiators met Sunday evening at the U.S. Capitol. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. just said, I'm willing to cut spending. 
Speaker McCarthy says that the U.S. government needs to spend less next year than they did this year. So will you agree to that? We have agreed to cut spending. We've cut spending and we're going to continue to cut spending. But the question is, what base do you start from? You just calculate what it means if you take all discretionary spending and you make no distinctions other than what the percentage number of the cut is. And some of it makes absolutely no sense at all. And so what we've done is we're going to have to sit down. I'm hoping that, uh, that uh, Speaker McCarthy is just waiting to negotiate with me. Those negotiations pick up today. That was a brilliant exchange between the President of the United States and rude. Bloomberg's Amory <laughs> from New York City this morning. Good morning. We'll touch base with AMH in Japan in just a moment. I want to touch base with the market just briefly. Equity futures unchanged on the S&P 500 going nowhere after the biggest one-week gain on the S&P going back to March. The Nasdaq 100 last week up almost 3.5%, even with yields higher every single day last week on both a two-year at a 10-year, a 10-year this morning, yield lower by a single basis point, 365.93. And we wake up again to another morning, anticipating, looking ahead to more talks on Capitol Hill. There are a range of estimates out there. Here's one from Goldman and the team, estimating that Treasury will drop below $30 billion in cash as soon as June 8th, but warning the following. The estimate is subject to substantial uncertainty, so there is certainly a chance that receipts could slow more than expected and leave the Treasury short of cash by June 1st or June 2nd. TK, we are taking this early June day, I think, increasingly seriously. I, I, absolutely. To me, that was the front line this weekend, and this is yelling out front, and, and maybe it is the acuity of being an economist, where she put a bow on it earlier, and the bow is moving, and it's moving quickly towards June. The other thing that's moving, I would point, is the calendar. We were talking about this on May 10th. It's not May 10th. It's May 22nd. No, we're running out of time, aren't we? We're running out of time. I think yeah. it's less about the mood <clears throat> of the moment. The mood music, so to speak, and much more about substance now. Let's get into the substance of it. What's the hangout? I, I would say, uh, yeah, I would, I would go with that. And the substance, of course, is the return of the president to Washington in Tokyo as our Amory Horton, our Bloomberg Washington correspondent. Amory, there's points in a campaign where there's hallmarks along the way, not in the news flow, but maybe a research piece that's out there or an op-ed piece. This morning, the Washington Post drops a bombshell of an op-ed piece directly addressing the president's age. He returns to Washington for a debt debate, but he also returns to Washington looking at an 82nd birthday, et cetera, on election day. How's he going to deal with that when you get back there and keep asking him tough questions? Well, I think that's exactly what the president needs to be doing uh, for the public to put rest aside these concerns. He's going to have to get in front of the public, take questions from the press, like he did yesterday um, at the end of the G7 summit. And that potentially can assuage voters' concerns about his age. Um, but, Tom, I'm not, I don't really think this is a bombshell. I think everyone has been talking about this, yes. whether or not the whispers are getting now louder echoes. Um, but everyone has been talking about this because it shows up in polls. Americans are concerned about his age. But also, in the same age bracket, I would say, is the nominee right now that's leading the Republican uh, candidate for president, and that's the former President Donald Trump. He's just four years behind Biden. So regardless, we're going to have a president, if it was to be a rematch yeah. of these two individuals, a president ending that next term in their 80s. Yeah, and, John, that was clearly addressed by the Washington Post in the op-ed piece. It was not just about President Biden. You wake up this morning, you just get the feeling, G7, what G7? <laughs> and, Marie, what did they talk about? Because the president had to leave at dinner early, even on the way back, reportedly on Air Force One, had to take a call with Speaker McCarthy. He's going to land, engage in talks almost immediately. Did he ever really leave behind yeah. the domestic issues? I think it's fair to say he had one foot here in Japan and one foot back home in Washington. He even brought Bruce Reed with him to make sure that there was an individual on the team keeping in touch with his key negotiating team in Washington. As you said, he left a dinner early to have a call, phone call with his team. He was constantly kept up to date on where the negotiations were. But the negotiations over the weekend were very much so on and off. 
breaking that impasse last night was this phone call the president had while he was on Air Force One with Speaker McCarthy. Speaker McCarthy then came out and said it was productive. He also, uh, really for one of the first times it's been since the president's been abroad, did not criticize his, his trip abroad and just said we're going to meet tomorrow. So that's today. President Biden and Speaker McCarthy, these two men in a room, and this is how a deal is going to be able to get over the finish line because it's really just these two individuals being able to come to an agreement. Biden alluded to that in the press conference saying, I guess he wants me to get home to be able to hammer out this negotiation. <laughs> um, so that's where all eyes are. And I think, you know, there's other topics, obviously, at the G7. China was a massive focus. President Zelensky was here in person. Russia was a massive focus. But for other world leaders and their concerns about future economic risks, when the president of the United States is in the room, that question would be going to him. Sir, are you going to have a default on treasuries, which is the bedrock and it underpins our entire global financial system? So it looms large over him. And Maria, I guess there's another way to reframe this and build on what John's talking about. Was this G7 a waste of time with a focus entirely on whether the U.S. would get its uh, ducks in a row <laughs> back at home? Or were there some really substantive t things that took place, in particular having to do with China, with a communique that the Financial Times described as the strong Longest condemnation of China yet, and really a tit for tat with China and Micron over the weekend that really left me highly confused about whether we're thawing or uh, exacerbating the tensions. I think this week was a key week. When we will look back in history in terms of a more multipolar world. Not only do you have Zelensky here at the G7, formerly this was a G8 where President Putin. Uh, used to think of this club he was part of in a very prestigious way. Zelensky was here, some 600 miles away from Russia's Far East. At the same time, you had Zelensky in the Middle East. Clearly for Putin, he's seeing that the Middle East uh, is no longer in, a, in his bag. And then you also had China Xi Jinping last week sitting down with five ex-Soviet states. So you can see there are changing movements in the geopolitical world. And when it comes to some substance that happened here on the foreign policy front, it was all about China. And the president reiterated that yesterday in his press conference. What this administration and the Europeans have really been able to coalesce around is language about not decoupling, but de-risking. And I asked the president's deputy national security advisor for economic affairs, Mike Pyle, What's the difference? And he said, look, de-risking means we don't want China to get a hold of advanced technology for their military. We have concerns about economic coercion and their market practices. But how can you call something a decouple when U.S.-China trade was at a record last year? So that is the framework that we are going into. But, Lisa, you also bring up a great point. Just hours after we got this communique, China came out and said that Micron did not pass their cybersecurity review. And one thing Rahm Emanuel, the U.S. ambassador to Japan, said to me was, we're no longer really just seeing China take these economic coercions against nations. They're now going against companies. So I think this was really um, a pivotal moment, really, in the geopolitical landscape this week, even though domestic concerns were definitely front and center. MH, brilliant coverage over the week over the weekend and this morning as well. Anne-Marie, thank you. Out of Japan, following the G7, the president in an exchange with Anne-Marie in the news conference talking about things improving with US-China relationships very shortly. And then Bramo then came the headline that Micron's about to get banned. Make sense of that. OK, I cannot make sense of anything that happened over the weekend. He said that he promised a real thawing in the relationship between U.S. and China. Then Micron can't sell goods in China. About 13 percent of the revenues, I believe, come from China. So real question here. You could see those shares lower by more than 5 percent in pre-market uh -huh. trading. And then you have China's commerce minister coming to be the first senior Chinese official to come to the U.S. I, I can't make sense of any of this. The stock down by a little more than 5 percent, as Lisa <laughs> indicated. Sarah Wolf of Morgan Stanley coming up very shortly from New York City this morning. Good morning. Your equity market just about unchanged on the S&P 500. Welcome back to work. Let's get your week started on the S&P 500. Just about unchanged. Good morning to you. Good morning is better than welcome back to work, isn't it? Good morning. It's going to be okay. <laughs> Just five days and then we get a weekend. Happy unchanged Monday. on the S&P. On a Nasdaq, negative 0.1%. 
On the NASDAQ 100, the weekly winning streak, four weeks long now on the NASDAQ. There we go. That winning streak, the longest since February. We had some more weight through last week on both the NASDAQ and the S&P 500 and finally breaking out of that very tight trading range on the S&P as well for a brief moment. Into the bond market, two-year, 10-year, 30-year, six consecutive days of yields higher on a two-year and a 10-year maturity. Yields back in this morning, down about three basis points on a two-year, 423.87 on a 10-year, down about a single basis point to 365.93. If you want more Fed speak, you get plenty of it this week. Bullard, Bostick, Daily. They speak today, Logan tomorrow, Waller on Wednesday. Then you get some Fed minutes as well. Look out for all of that going into this week. Tom, are you excited? Yeah. OK. I, the, the speakers, I mean, how many are next week? At four or five next week, four, you know, until they go into the quiet period, right? And then bingo. I, no I, Fed speak whatsoever until the Fed meeting. Minimal value. Minimal value. Yeah, I just right. think it's minimal value. Chairman Powell on Friday, minimal That's value. That's different. No. no. Take a listen to what That's the Fed different. chairman had to say. We've come a long way in policy tightening, and the stance of policy is restrictive. And we face uncertainty about the lagged effects of our tightening so far and about the extent of credit tightening from recent banking stresses. Having come this far, we can afford to look at the data and the evolving outlook and make careful assessments. Do they have the luxury of time not to hike in June, to wait, to look around? And I use that language very specifically and very carefully for a reason. I don't hear that word pause when the chairman speaks. And Neil Kashkari yeah. of the Minneapolis Fed over the weekend to the journal also going out of the way to make that point as well. If the committee chooses to skip a meeting because we want to get more information, I could make the argument why that makes sense. A skip to get more information is very different in my mind than saying, hey, we think we're done. Yeah, I'm going to look at June 2nd, non-farm payrolls. I mean, it's just that simple. Then CPI the 13th CPI, is what I think, CPI yeah. just before the meeting, I think, is way, way more important. Their data dependency waits to the last moment. Writing with Ellen Zentner and Morgan Stanley, their senior economist, joins us now, Sarah Wolf. Sarah, uh, thanks so much for coming by today. I want to look at the economic data today. Uh, Lisa started the show uh, with this this morning, and that is the inflation data on Friday, PCE deflator. How sticky is sticky now for you and Ellen Zentner? Core PC inflation is going to look pretty elevated this Friday when we get it uh, for the April report. As we saw in the CPI print, though, a lot of the upside is being <clears throat> driven by the good side, which took a bit of a hiatus because used car prices came back up. We are seeing some nice alleviation in the housing components, and that's going to be key as well for the May CPI print during the blackout period ahead of the FOMC meeting mm -hmm. in order for them to feel confident uh, not raising rates again in June. Debt crisis, no debt crisis. I got a two-year yield, 4.24%. How does that change Morgan Stanley's view forward? Uh, the debt ceiling is definitely of concern. A lot of the economic outlook uh, no longer applies if we cross the X day. We know that it would be pretty catastrophic for the economic outlook. Almost 20 percent of household income comes from government transfers, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Um, we are looking to get closer to a deal. Biden and McCarthy are going back to the drawing table today, so it's a bit encouraging. Uh, but we know that, uh, you know, all things are off the table if we cross that date in early June. Say that again. 20% of household income in this country is from government transfers. 20%. Most of it is Social Security. So imagine if you're an elderly household and all of a sudden you're not getting that Social Security check anymore, wow. not getting that Medicaid check, unemployment insurance. I mean, it's truly an incredible amount of income. Tom, I knew the number was big, but that big? Yeah, I agree with that. I thought it was 17%, 16%. But, you know, in the zeitgeist that all three of us read in this morning, is anybody talking about cutting off Social Security checks? No. I don't see it in the zeitgeist. Well, they've got to provide an outlook when the Federal Reserve gets together in the middle of June. Very difficult to put one together if this is still playing out. Exactly. Let's pretend it's not for, for your benefit and for us as well. What do you think that outlook from the Fed is going to look like in the middle of June? We still feel confident that the Fed is going to be pausing, and so they're not going to have to deliver another hike in June. Of course, it's going to remain data dependent. We're expecting to see a little more alleviation in that sticky core services component in the May CPI reading, but that's coming out during the blackout period. So really, the Fed speak this week, the Fed speak last week, wants to set up markets to be pricing in what the Fed wants to do going Going into the June meeting. To John's point, is it skip the new pause? And are they just going to keep skipping meetings rather than pausing ever and using the P word? Well, they want to remain flexibility, two-way flexibility. If they need a hike, if they need to cut, they need to keep the door open. And so, yes, they don't want to explicitly use that word pause. So 
Over the past uh, five days or so, we've seen a real about face when it comes to banks. On one side, we saw you know Western Alliance come out and be a lot stronger, and people cheered. Crisis over. And then we heard from Jay Powell, still concerned about rapidly tightening credit conditions. We heard from Janet Yellen about possibly additional bank mergers. Today, Neil Kashkari wrote an essay basically saying we need to see banks raise more capital. What's your view in what the smoke signals are about where we are in this? kerfuffle of banking? Yeah, we're definitely getting cross signals, mixed data on the banking sector. What you could, what you definitely know is that Chair Powell still wants to reiterate that the banking system is stable, that things are still somewhat healthy. Um, what the What's happening in the banking sector, though, is basically giving us more policy tightening than what we would need from interest rates. And that's what Chair Powell said on Friday, is that there's less risk of them doing too little at this point because you're getting this incremental further well, tightening in lending standards. When you're around the table arguing, and, you know, anytime Ellen Zentner holds a meeting, there's a lot of argument. That's, that's something that's good and healthy. But is it is a pause or a skip, did you call it? A skip. We're still deciding. Jesus. <laughs> if it's a skip or a pause, is it asymmetric or symmetric? You know, it's it's definitely uh, a bit asymmetric. I think that really, I think right yeah. now risks are still leaned towards probably having to do a bit more, especially if the soft landing scenario plays out. Um, you know, with all the hawkish Fed speak that we got over the past week, they're basically trying to push market pricing out, showing that they're not cutting rates anytime soon. So I think that, you know, they're still leaning on the side of doing too much rather than too little. I think we got more hawkish Fed speak over the past week than dovish Fed speak. Where's your cut call over at Morgan Stanley right now? When have you got the first cut penciled in? We have the first cut penciled in for March of 2024. So we still have quite a ways to go before we get that first cut. What's the backdrop that brings about that call? We have core inflation coming down just below 3%. Um, jobs have been running around 40K for several months at that point. Unemployment rates above 4%. Really comes down to inflation, though. They're the conditions that you're looking for, basically, Exactly. Right? Inflation okay. below 3%, that's, in particular services. That's a whole different... What they're describing there is a whole different world, after all. I mean, it's radically different than what exactly. we're doing right now. Well, you've got to do one of two things. That was Walt Disney, though. I, that was beautiful. Great. I, I got it. Tightly picked up on the Walt Disney line. Do you want to sing it? No, I don't want to sing it. All right, you going to watch The Mermaid? Little uh, Mermaid? I may, you know, you it's okay. like big budget. You All know. Right. Derailed already. <laughs> Sarah, let's get back to the Fed talk. <laughs> Got to make two calls here. One is the conditions that lead to a rate cut, and two, when you think those conditions will actually be achievable. What is it about the trend right now for inflation that you see dropping back to below three by, say, the first quarter of next year? We've had a really good run on the good side deflationary for um, several months, in particular motor vehicle prices. So we're not overreading into one month of prices coming back up. So we feel confident that that's going to continue to play out throughout 2023. Also, all the housing data is pointing to continued moderation in shelter inflation. And even though we got to step back up in the last CPI print, it's still below that six month, 12 month trend that we've had on shelter inflation. Also, we're seeing the labor market start to slacken a bit. Um, you know, job opening are coming off, the hiring rates declining, fewer people are leaving their jobs. So all of that should be indicating that these sticky core services should be rolling over soon as well. All of these put them together. And what we're seeing right now is ongoing resilience in an economy that has seen a sort of rolling recession in different industries. Right. And inflation is going to start peaking back up in certain areas as you start to see a recovery there. So what's the chance and how much has it increased of a June rate hike, of actually that meeting being live in a way that they kind of want to keep the door open for at a time when the market is just absolutely pushing back against what they're saying. It's still live. We get another jobs report, another inflation report, as you mentioned. So what gets us there to another hike? Another Whopper jobs print, maybe somewhere close to 200 or higher. If core inflation is close to 0.4 percent again next month, um, in particular, if that services component is reaccelerating, I mean, that squarely puts a June hike back on the table. The, the thing that people are worried about, the reason why a skip or a pause or whatever you want to call it is on the table is because they don't want to see some sort of financial crisis really uh, prompted by their policy. So at what point are they getting into the fragile zone? Do we have a sense of that? At what point all of a sudden additional rate hike is the make it or break it kind of po point? I don't think that we're there quite yet. Um, you know, <clears throat> banking conditions are still somewhat stable. Credit conditions are tightening, but it hasn't gotten too extreme. Um, but 
you know, it, it's tough. It's a tough call for them. They're going to be watching the data as it comes yeah. in, um, but we're not quite there yet on if it's one hike. I mean, right now we're just playing with 5%, 5.25%. 5 I don't really think that 25 basis points is a make it or break mm -hmm. it for the Fed at this point. You know, we're all focused on the two-year yield, 4.24%. I just looked at the 30-year mortgage. In six days, it's moved 6.8-something percent mm -hmm. to 7.04%. I don't think anybody's talking about that. Yeah, the housing market, it's a big push and pull right now. I mean, the second that affordability pressure is easy, you have all these people hopping back into the market. So it signals that you need to keep rates high because otherwise you're going to see that in flood of demand again. We get quite a bit of housing data this week as well. That's actually starting to show some incremental improvement in the housing market. But then, as you oh. said, mortgage rates come back up, demand is going to amazing. come off again. Yeah. Just amazing. What, what do you think that's about? Do you think it's about inventory, lack of supply? I mean, there's just a huge demand still for housing. We have lack of supply. And so, I mean, you have this huge population of prime age home buyers that are wait waiting to get into the market, bummed that they missed their chance when we had two year, three, uh, two, three percent mortgage rates. And so once they see some alleviation in mortgage rates and home prices are coming off a bit, we saw existing home sale prices come off by over one percent last week. People are hopping back in. I'd like to see more of that in New York, wouldn't you, Tom? <laughs> I, I mean, I'm always, whenever I'm talking about these, you know which side of the trade I'm talking on. about. I think everyone knows, right? You just need to see a little bit more of that. Maybe a whole lot more of that. Sarah, well, thank you. Thanks Morgan for having Stanley. me. We keep setting policy for the boomers. That's the problem, TK. We're looking after the house prices. I, that you know, is an The millennials age. want to get in. They want to get in, and the boomers just won't let it go. He, just won't let it correct. He turned to me after. It clearly wasn't going to bite with him. <laughs> so he's basically... He's coming he's in. Oh, you think it's funny, I'm recruiting you. I'm recruiting you. To what? The, just the getting you on my side, side. Before, before TK comes back <laughs> before, with some of the same. Early, early, Tom, the floor's yours, please. Early April, the mortgage is 6.70%. Life is good. We're right. moving in the right direction. Lisa brought it up, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Boom. Complete reversal. Just supporting the asset price of boomers, Tom. That's been the last 20 well, years. Well, you did it last year. You had, you had rented $4,100 a month in Manhattan. <laughs> Which? <laughs> yeah, for a walk up. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, that probably would get you a warm walk up well, in, you know, in Manhattan. Well, you know, I'm on the seventh floor no, walk up. 4500 4500 yeah, probably fifth floor right walk up. Now, mm. a TK's getting so expensive. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. So, back to Rajat for Top Gen coming up. Sarah, this was great. Run. If you stick around, this gets messy. It really does. <laughs> Yields down a basis point, a 10 year, 366 from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Facebook owner Meta Platforms is hit by a record $1.3 billion European Union privacy fine and given a deadline to stop shipping users' data to the U.S. after regulators say it failed to protect personal information from the prying eyes of American security services. Meta has five months to suspend any future transfer of personal data to the U.S. and six months to stop the unlawful processing, including storage in the U.S., of transferred personal EU data. China has questioned the sincerity of the Biden administration as it pushes to resume high-level diplomatic talks with Beijing. A Chinese foreign ministry spokeswoman saying, quote, the U.S. side asks for communication on the one side, yet on the other, suppresses and contains China by every possible means. President Biden says he expects ties with China to improve very shortly, dismissing an alleged spy balloon that caused a diplomatic spec earlier this year as, quote, silly. Micron technology stock fell after China delivered the latest salvo in the escalating chip war with the U.S., announcing that Micron products have failed to pass a cybersecurity review. Beijing has warned operators of key infrastructure against buying products from the American firm due to cybersecurity risks. The U.S. Commerce Department says the ruling has no basis in fact. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. There's always uncertainty um, about uh, tax receipts and spending. Um, and so it's hard to be absolutely certain about this, but 
Um, my assessment is that the odds of reaching June 15th while being able to pay all of our bills is quite low. Janet Yellen with a pretty bleak outlook for Treasury and the cash balance at the moment. The U.S. Treasury Secretary speaking on NBC over the weekend from New York City. Welcome to the program on TV and radio. This is a price action right now in the equity market. We are negative by not even a tenth of 1%. No drama here. We're down by 0.07% on the S&P. Yields come in about a basis point, 10-year, 366. The headline of the last hour from J.P. Morgan boosting its outlook. Boosting its outlook after the purchase of First Republic Bank and Thomas, we've been joking. And you've been joking, really. You've been on top of this over the last couple of months. It's like they're doing this with their hand in front of the face, sort of, you know, well, we're boosting our outlook. Things are OK. Almost embarrassed you know, of how good things are at the moment. People led by you, I uh, bust my chops about the history of it, but the history is real. Let's review it really quickly here. Uh, the nation blew up in about 1840. Andrew Jackson said, no, we're not going to do this. We don't trust the big cities. And that was the second bank of the United States. There was a third bank in one, 1870, whatever. The fourth bank was considered to be in the library of J.P. Morgan's mansion on Madison Avenue, the founding of the Federal Reserve. Is this the fifth bank? of the United States, the combination of J.P. Morgan and Bank of America. I don't even put the other ones in there. You and don't even talk about the others anymore. That's the scope and scale right. here. I Huge. Mean, it's, and getting bigger. It's big. Uh, right now, and it, it's, it's very important to have with her because she knows all the names. Uh, Shanali Bassick's with us as we look at the law firm Pinto, Lake, Peepsick, Barnum, and Petno. Today they're going to do a road show, right? Mm -hmm. How is their road show different because James Gorman waltzed out a week before and said, I got one year left? Listen, the succession race has certainly been watched very closely over at J.P. Morgan, especially because Jamie Dimon has been there for a long time. And over the last decade or so, we've seen so much top talent come in and out of J.P. Morgan. Many of those people are leading other companies now. Think Charlie Scharf, for example, over at Wells Fargo. So that I on Marianne Lake and Jennifer Pepsack is pretty huge. What about Actually, Pinto, Barnum, and Petno. Well, it's, it's kind offer. of always Great seen offer. as uh, Daniel Daniel Pinto has always been kind of the man in the envelope. When Jamie Dimon has gotten sick, he has stepped up, he has taken over. But it, the really, the succession plan lies to these two women. And so the question is when? I think that is the bigger question almost more than who at this point. Is J.P. Morgan ready to toss the baton on at all? We talked about an elegant solution provided by James Gorman over at Morgan Stanley. You and I did on Friday. I just wonder what that would be thought of over at J.P. Morgan. Just this idea that someone as big as Jamie Dimon might think about becoming the chairman and just staying there as the chairman and occupying that sole seat at the same time someone steps up and takes the CEO role. Well, yeah, and it's executive chairman over at Morgan Stanley too. So you would still presumably have somebody else really leading the board there. Executive chairman being almost kind of an advisory role. Uh, that is an elegant solution. The other question though here though is with Morgan Stanley, they have folded into major acquisitions. They have made a lot of progress in doing so. Can can J.P. Morgan move on without integrating First Republic at scale a little more? And what's next in terms of acquisitions? There was this Wall Street Journal uh, article over the weekend saying that J.P. Morgan now accounts for 13 percent of the nation's deposits and 21 percent of all credit card spending at a time when supposedly we're still worried about too big to fail, but not really because those actually were the banks that survived. I mean, how much are they going to try to hide their scope and scale in some of these meetings? I think pretty intensively in the sense that you see very high up in the presentations already the conversation around heightened scrutiny on banks and the heightened costs tied to the FDIC assessments and what that could mean for future costs for firms like J.P. Morgan. There's about four or five different bullet points on just the the uncertainties around the different types of regulations they'll face around the world. When it comes to banks, remember for First Republic, they kind of had to waive this idea of a deposit cap here to bring on a new depository institution. Their rivals were actually kind of skeptical here. Certain rivals were very skeptical that the government would let them buy F uh, FRC in the early days. By the end of the process, there was more certainty here that J.P. Morgan could keep the cost lowest for everybody. But again, remember, they did have to waive rules to get this to happen. The fact that this is high up in their presentation and the fact that Neil Kashkari came out with this essay this morning talking about how he would like to see higher uh, capital requirements for all banks, but particularly the too-big-to-fail banks, he pointed out. Do you get the sense that this is a very serious proposal, or do you get the sense this is a lot of lip service to kind of gloss over some of the recent turmoil. I think something I worry about when it comes to bank regulation is how much it changes under 
every future administration. I think what's interesting here is that under the Michael Barr era for the Federal Reserve, there's a sense that things can change pretty quickly here, not without pushback. Jamie Dimon has been one of the biggest, most vocal critics on some of these stress capital buffers. And when you look at the, the requirements under the stress testing, saying we have passed them over and over, their own uh, current assumptions here are kind of more than what you see. It's for this year alone, a 5.8% unemployment rate peak when they are thinking about the reserve. So they're reserving more than what you're seeing in the market, per se. So they're saying, we're doing the work here. We don't need more work. You're yeah. going to choke off the banking system is the, the threat here uh, at a time where you need credit in the market. It, we forget the scale. Morgan Stanley employees, 82,000. J.P. Morgan employees, 297,000. To John's point earlier, we're making jokes about it, except it's not a joke. Are they soft selling how profitable they are? Are they going to play down the ginormousness of the bank? Soft selling. They could soft sell all they want, but you and I know they ink the highest returns on equity in all of Wall Street by a significant margin when it comes to the biggest of the banks. There are some smaller banks that just by profitability can do better. But listen, to your point, this, they're large. And by the way, if you look at their uh, statements here, their presentation, they have levers. They continued efficiencies is one of the little bullet points you'll see deep in that press release and in, in these presentations. They can cut <laughs> to become more profitable if they want to, but they're already quite profitable. Just want to be really clear about something that James Gorman's talking about 12 months and Jamie Dimon's still talking about five years. So if you are just tuning in, there's no immediate conversation yeah, about yeah, Dimon well, headed towards know, the exit. We're trying to create some excitement soon. here. But yeah, Can we finish right. on Morgan Stanley just briefly? Sure. Another thing we were discussing going into the weekend, Shinali, together was reflecting on the time at Goldman Sachs when Lloyd Blankfein was saying, it's time to go. And then you had this really sort of awkward moment between Harvey Schwartz and David Solomon for a little while. Can you tell us, waking up this morning, what Morgan Stanley's going to look like? over the next several months, how much tension there will be between these two individuals. We have seen this fight play out over and over at Morgan Stanley, where they say they will make an announcement, and then they wait 6, 8, 12 months before they give folks the job. This uh, Ted or Andy conversation, they call it inside of Morgan Stanley, has been a conversation for many, many months. It's the parlor, parlor game of, of Wall Street, really. So the pressure on Ted Pick, who runs Institutional Securities, and Andy Saperstein to just perform, to show which one is the, the ultimate leader, I think, um, is really something to Are you watch. telling me we still haven't made that decision? You think they still haven't made that decision at Morgan Stanley? You know, it's interesting. If they've made the decision, it's pretty closely held. And so the drama is real. But have they made their minds up? I, you know, I think it's a tough one on this one. Succession at Morgan Stanley, Tom. <laughs> is that going to work for you? No spoilers. I still haven't seen the final this episode. This feels so. medieval. It's no like, spoilers. you know, <laughs> come out there with a lance and see who survives, and then they're I, I, just sort of, you, you know. know if somebody asked me over the weekend, why is it like this? Why are you following this? And the issue is, and should I help me here, if you're not picked, you leave, right? That's been the standard. We were talking about co-presidents earlier. Can that be something that's done? It doesn't work. It's not traditionally worked. Um, but it's not just them they leave. Do some of their key deputies leave? Yeah. And this is a very loyal bank <laughs> in terms of all the people that are under these two men in particular and Dan Simkowitz, who runs investment management. So you, you worry and you think about attrition. A leave and investment. maybe turn up somewhere else. Harvey Schwartz sure. turning up at Carlo years later. Yeah, She's no, but it's the, it's the, I can't even say it's a, a new tradition. Prusan I think it's just, just left too. Tradition. Remember, Jonathan Prusan, the True. COO, longtime contender. Uh, we're waiting to see where he ends up too. Are you connecting that story now to what has happened in the last month or so? You know, you have to hire from within, I think. When you look at the CEOs, I think it's a really tough case if you bring in somebody externally. I've been asking, can Charlie Scharf come back and lead J.P. Morgan, for example? Can you bring somebody back? And I think it's a really tough sell when you have a bench. Were, were you up there. at Oak Hill this weekend? I mean, you're such a hitter. I mean, all the banks are up there. They're I all I doing a financial ballet. This weekend, Tom. <laughs> I have no <laughs> idea. A break. I've never been up there, Tom. Oak Hill looks beautiful up in Rochester, New York. It, looks it, beautiful. it is. It's Kodak money from a million years ago, 1926 and they built it out and then what they did is they restored it and John those bunkers I never when I caddied there those bunkers did not look like that I'll this tell you so that so much more classy than talking about the interns in the Hamptons clearly with David Solomon so much better <laughs> TK yeah. I'm not going to let you gloss over that you caddied Oak Hill back in the day I caddied Oak Hill the Trevino 68 I had the honor right in this room actually to speak to Lee Trevino about very how cool. he changed golf. That's it was very cool. really, I talked to him about driving down Kilbourne Drive and what was it like before you stepped onto Oak Hill. And he got, he hit tears. He really got emotional. If Jim Nance ever wants the day off, 
step into the booth, TK. Coming up, Shanali Basic will address the tea at Little Poison. <laughs> <laughs> From New York, this is Bloomberg. The recession that everybody's been waiting for isn't coming, hasn't come. We are investing into a slowing economy. Consumers kind of moving towards the front end, institutional going towards the long end. We think the Fed is going to keep rates higher for longer. The risks are that they don't even cut this year, they start to cut next year. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Coming up, a week of debt ceiling negotiations and Fed speak. Wait. Stay in bed. <laughs> I'm from New York City this morning. <laughs> If I had the choice of doing the same thing, good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. <coughs> this is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bramberts. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Equity futures just a little softer on the S&P 500 after a decent week of gains on the S&P. A week of gains, higher yields, even with this conversation around this debt ceiling drama. Speaker McCarthy, the President of the United States, those talks will resume a little bit later on this morning, this afternoon. But TK, at the moment, it's kind of good, then it's kind of bad. Talks are OK. We're moving forward. We're not moving forward. We're stepping away. Where on earth are we? Yeah, for Global Wall Street, we're going to have a great conversation on this with Goldman Sachs London here on the range that we're in. But, John, to start a Monday, futures 4201, Dow 335, NASDAQ touching near 14,000. We're at the top, the tippy top of the recent range. Four weeks of gains on the NASDAQ. And Lisa, that gain last week took place even with decent data, better than expected in many places, pushing yields higher through every single session last week. It was artificial intelligence hype gone uh, absolutely bonkers, or basically people were saying this time is different. And you heard that uh, over the weekend in a number of different analyst notes. You know, you started the, the show saying we're going to get debt ceiling negotiations and Fed speak, so stay in bed. And I think macro is staying in bed. And that is the reason why we're seeing this range, even though the stories underneath are getting a lot more interesting. And I think that's been a theme that's been sort of head spinning for the people trying to discern some sort of macro theme. But under the hood, there's some real changes going on. I agree are strongly. On. Yield, the yield space is what to focus on this week. We're all going to look at equities. Can you imagine 4,300 on equities back to where we were a year ago? Forget about it. What I'm looking at is the yield, 4.24% two-year yield. And we mentioned in the last hour this surge in the 30-year mortgage, John. Early February, 6.45%. We're now at 7.04%, above 7%. Are we finally going to see that price correction off the back of that? because it's hardly gotten started. We're talking about a rebound in housing activity in America now, Tom, with 7% rates. John, I don't know. I was in a restaurant Saturday night, and they said, when is Farrell going to do the real yield again? The real yield, 1.41%. <laughs> Uh, 1.41% on the 10-year real yield, John. We don't quote that like we used to. TK, that's rude. <laughs> that is rude. I want to get to this. That's silly we You talked about getting beneath the hood of all of this. OK, this is Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley. There are many technical signals that conflict with the idea that this is the beginning of a new cyclical bull market. And here are the list provided. Here is the list provided by Mike. Extreme narrowness, so poor breadth. This is all tech, all of that stuff. You've heard that stuff before. Lisa, quality defensive leadership and broad cyclical underperformance, small caps, think banks, regionals, etc. So I was talking with Neil Dutta on Friday, and I was pointing to all of these different indicators that point to a Morgan Stanley's uh, Mike Wilson view of the world. And he said he his first indication to say, OK, Boomer, let, none of these signals work anymore simply because we are in a new paradigm. And here is the question. Are we in a new paradigm with respect to the underlying um, drivers, perhaps having some mixed signals? But kind of the cross currents not coming up with anything conclusive. This is way. a huge deal. It goes to the theme of my book of the summer from Olivier Blanchard, the other factors that are out there. And is one of them a technology overlay? John, you mentioned NVIDIA. I don't even know what NVIDIA does, to be honest. But the answer is that these tech companies <laughs> on a moonshot. It's flying. They're on That's a moonshot. That's what you need to know. Meta as well. Top two performing Facebook. names on the S&P 500. But they're down a little bit today. They got mm. the European fine timeout share. Yeah, that was good. OK, yeah. let's move on. Here's yeah. the price action on the S&P. <laughs> down 0.1% on the S&P 500. Yields look like this in a bond market. Down a single basis point. 10-year. Lisa, 365. 93. All right. Today, we do get more debt talks, which I know yes. everyone is so excited about. President Biden and House uh, Speaker Kevin McCarthy resuming talks. Yeah. Biden in uh, Washington after his trip. I got to say, 
They're going to say something. It's going to be constructive. Then yeah. tomorrow it's going to be negative. For those of you on radio, couch photos. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's where we are right now. Exactly. Wednesday, and talking about <clears throat> NVIDIA, the chip maker, they're going to be reporting earnings oh. after the bell. They're up 100, almost 114% really year to date. So just a small 114% move. Key for me is how much are they going to ratify some of the hype around AI, around chat GPT-like technology? How much are they going to uh, increase some of the projections, even in the face of some tensions with China? And this week... In terms of the data front, in addition to all of the Fed speak that John was mentioning earlier, we get uh, global flash PMIs tomorrow, FOMC meeting minutes on Wednesday. And really, this is the key, PCE inflation data on Friday. If you end up seeing inflation, this key metric that the Fed looks at as being sticky, how much does this challenge the idea of a skip? Not a pause, but a skip oh, of this is the June the, meeting. This is the new word for April, right? For June, I should say. They've been very skip. careful about not call, calling this a pause because they don't want to communicate that they're done unconditionally. They don't want to do that because when we're pricing in cuts still in the back half When of the you year. were a kid, could you skip rope? Like, you know, this I wasn't thing, very good at that. I was I wasn't terrible. Good at that. I, was I loved terrible. it. Did you? Did you, you of course. I, I can just see that. you cranking it out. You know, what, getting like, ready for Coventry and, you know. Or skipping ahead of football. Jump I don't rope, think so. Yeah, yeah. Lisa mentioned the couch photos. Very controversial couch photos, you know. Oh, I missed this. The sorry. hybrid shoe worn by certain U.S. officials. The hybrid shoe. I, I, you can I see miss it this. in the shot there. It's this hybrid of a sneaker and a dress shoe. Have oh you seen these? Oh, my God. Very controversial. Great New York Times piece over the weekend. If you get the chance to have a read, have a read. The hybrid shoe, TK. Are you a fan of the hybrid shoe? No. Worn by people like no. Speaker McCarthy. Sartorial criticism yeah, with that, John that's, that's what this is. That's, <laughs> that's what this is. <laughs> that's literally. If you're going into the Oval to meet with the President of the United States. <laughs> you don't wear a hybrid shoe. You're going to wear like this you thing know. with this white sole. Literally, what would you Boris, need to what, have your own color. 10 Downing Street, what would Boris do? Well, I can't see I'm Boris sure in that, a hybrid. I'm not sure when you go to meet with the President you want to ask yourself that question, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> what, would, what would Boris do? <laughs> WWBD. Probably not, probably not the great I mean, start. <laughs> Rishi Sunak's going to have some fancy custom-made shoe. Rishi would know what to do. He would no, know what with, to do. Without a doubt. Hey. Without okay. a doubt. You would just wear a nice lace-up, Oxford. Okay. Just, Sh you know. Sharon Bell is going, did I sign up for this? Sharon agrees with me. <laughs> Sharon Bell joins us now. Senior European equity strategist at Goldman Sachs. Sharon, I'm going to start here, not with that. <laughs> start the equity market. There's been some pushback against the, the overweighting of the rest of the world, Europe, China versus the United States from... Your peers over at J.P. Morgan, Miss Love Mateka, they closed out, closed out their overweight Europe versus the United States. Sharon, where are you on that debate right now as a team? Yeah, we still generally like non-U.S. markets to the U.S. because we still think the U.S. is uh, on the more expensive side. Um, we don't have any upside for the U.S. market for the S&P. In fact, our end-year target for the S&P is 4,000. That's below where it is today. Um, but we don't expect a, a big bear market either um, in U.S. stocks. We just think that they're in a kind of fat and flat range and we're more toward the top end of that range. And the, the, for the rest of the world, um, it, it, cheaper markets generally. Um, Japan has been exceptionally cheap and right. performed well more recently, um, but Europe too still. If you have a fat and flat range, and I love that phrase, it really captures the mathematics. Critical question, do you trade the range or do you almost go buy and hold and just oscillate through it Tell you figure out what to do. Yeah, I mean, it means that you don't have to make dramatic shifts in your portfolio because you're not looking at an environment where we're expecting huge upside or, or a very dramatic bear market and, and large downside. I think the problem with the fat and flat range at the moment, though, is first of all, we are towards the top of it. And secondly, there is a competitor asset out there called cash, which is now offering you 5%, which relative to a fat and flat range looks quite attractive. So if cash was at zero, then that's not really a competitor. Um, the fat and flat range might be good enough for you and you getting dividends and things like that, um, the optionality of upside over the longer term and equities, et cetera. But when cash is offering you 5%, then actually that looks relatively quite attractive. Sharon, you're talking about how you like ex-U.S. assets more still, although we were talking last week about how the data in Europe is starting to roll over just a touch, whether it's forward-looking surveys or PMI data uh, or anything related to China's recovery. At what point would that get you to rethink whether a sort of overweight European bias really is the way to go? Um, you know, I think the data on Europe has been a little bit mixed. You've had sort of some of the industrial data, particularly out of Germany, um, a little bit weaker, and that for sure may be related to China um, and the weakness in the data that we've seen there in April. 
um, and May. And bear in mind that Europe is very exposed to that sort of export route, that trade route, especially Germany. But elsewhere in Europe, the consumer data is still very strong. The labour market data is good. The services right. side of the PMIs are very good. So I, I don't see Europe as overall in danger. Uh, Sharon, Rishir Sharma had a blistering essay in the Financial Times over the weekend saying people like you have it wrong. Wall Street is talking about a booming China, a 5 6 percent GDP reset. Dr. Sharma says, uh, maybe not. What's the new amendment at Goldman Sachs on what the Pacific Rim and China will do, and how does that fold into global prosperity? Yeah, I mean, the, definitely China is disappointed um, in the last couple of months, both the consensus and our own estimates. Uh, the PMI data has been weaker in China, but also the hard data, things like um, fixed asset investment, retail sales, industrial production have all weakened in China. Um, we do think that China growth will be reasonably good this year, but we think next year growth in China will only be running at around 4.5%. In our view, the China's authorities are pinpoint easing particular parts of the economy, looking to target particular parts that are especially weak, like use unemployment, for example. Um, but beyond that, they don't want to do broad scale easing in China. Um, you still have uh, the property market, which is over levered, will take some time to unwind. Um, you still have other issues in China, such as the shrinkage in the population. You still have the um, US China relations, which have obviously soured in um, recent years. And, that's hitting China, trade and growth. So uh, there are, I think, a lot of underlying negatives on China. So I don't completely disagree with that view um, that China is vulnerable. But I guess the China equity market is extremely inexpensive um, and that perhaps already reflects some of these risks. Sharon, Sharon Bao of Goldman. Sharon, appreciate it. As always, Europe this summer set to absolutely boom on the services front travel and leisure. Look out for Michael O'Leary of Ryanair a little bit later on this morning. Looking forward to catching up with him. Do you want some reviews, guys? Here you go. Colt menswear commentator Derek Guy called out the foot gear as a clear lapse in dignity. The star director of GQ called it, quote, awful. <laughs> this New York Times piece is amazing. <laughs> Honestly, the footwear of Hakeem Jeffries and Speaking McCarthy in okay. the Oval Office. Honestly, my favourite, my favourite is every Monday morning, the one thing that gets you the most jazzed it's, it's up amazing. is sartorial reviews. Do dress sneakers that. belong uh, in the Oval Office? That was one of the best things I read this uh, week. <laughs> that tells John me a lot John many I levels. may not agree on the shoulder cut, but I'm fully on board with the Pharaoh criticism. Really? <laughs> yes. What about your hybrid Gucci's? Well, I don't know the Gucci's, hybrid they're Gucci's, Pradas. though. Oh. I had to go to Pradas. <laughs> they're hybrid Pradas. They're not, they're well, you know, Pradas. come on. Yeah? No. Gucci, wouldn't wear Gucci's them in the coming back. That's Gucci, That's Gucci, Gucci let the guy go that was doing all the goofy stuff, and they got the new conservative guy coming in. Oh, how's that going? Him, yes. Because they've it's been struggling, haven't soon, they? Soon. They, okay. They, I happen to have been in the store, don't ask why, and... I got a full <laughs> briefing. The guy's here and he's moving quickly. We should do this segment more often. Yeah. Celine Equities looks good too. Down by 0.1%. Yeah. We won't talk about them. No, Let's Celine's, not do that. You know, they, mm. they're, they're talking to me about a I'm sweaters. sure. Yeah. A collab? <laughs> no, yeah, a collab. Yeah. <laughs> they're a big thing these days, Tom. They are. Yeah, from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Ukraine reported damage to dozens of buildings and vehicles in the southern city of Dnipro after another barrage of Russian missiles overnight. Ukrainian forces say they managed to shoot down four of the 16 missiles launched, as well as 20 drones. President Vladimir Zelensky is expected to return to Kyiv after attending the Group of Seven, Seven Summit in Japan, where he suggested Russian forces are losing control of the eastern city of Bakhmut after months of fighting. President Biden and Republican House Speaker Kevin McCarthy are set to meet today for talks on averting a catastrophic U.S. default as time runs short and key differences remain. Negotiations have been whipsawed between progress and deadlock for days as the two sides simultaneously grapple for political advantage and a deal. And pick negotiators met Sunday evening at the U.S. Capitol. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg.
moment news breaks, no one covers the world like Bloomberg. A lot of the focus and the momentum here is what to do with inflation. But again, this is still a monetary policy story. The first round results with President Recep Tayyip Erdogan showing resilience and strength on his nationalist platform. A number of leaders have come out on both sides of the aisle and say we will not default. That does seem like they are making progress. Bloomberg, your global business authority. You just said I'm willing to cut spending. Speaker McCarthy says that the U.S. government needs to spend less next year than they did this year. So will you agree to that? We have agreed to cut spending. We've cut spending and we're going to continue to cut spending. But the question is, what base do you start from? You just calculate what it means if you take all discretionary spending and you make no distinctions other than what the percentage number of the cut is. And some of it makes absolutely no sense at all. And so what we've done is we're going to have to sit down. I'm hoping that, uh, that uh, Speaker McCarthy is just waiting to negotiate with me. And we're waiting for just that a little bit later. AMH and the President of the United States at a G7 in Japan. That G7 interrupted several times. The President needing to leave a dinner early one occasion. On another occasion, flying back on Air Force One, taking a call with Speaker McCarthy. And we're told that call went, wow, that it was constructive. Some soothing words, Tom. Yeah, he probably, flying back, he probably wants succession. And, you know, between Jess and Rob, I just think it's just too Don't much. Don't you dare ruin this. <laughs> I'm not going to ruin Don't it. Don't you dare. John, who was the one person in the United States of America that ha- didn't, couldn't get through season one of succession? You didn't like it? It's not, I just don't have the time. I, okay. I actually enjoyed it to a great extent, but I just don't have the time. Is season one or two, good. The rest of it, nah. That's what I've heard from a lot of people. Yeah, take it or leave it. You know. But I think once you're in it, you kind of want to complete but, it. But, I mean, Jess, I mean, it's just, you know, and, and Rob, I mean, th- there's some tough this? decisions Wait, to make. Where are you taking this? Oh, we're what's, going to Anne Marie Horton. She's got, watched that. What's Rob got to do with this? I, Rob, uh, there's some huge tension here. Oh, you know. okay. You think he's got an answer to that? <laughs> I think he's read something. You no. never know. That's the problem with TK. You <laughs> never know. He says everything with such authority. Yeah. That it might be true. <laughs> so carry so, on. Joining us now. My whole career with him. It's like half Tokyo. on Google, half on air. Bloomberg's, is, is it real? Just like him. <laughs> joining us now, Bloomberg's succession correspondent in Tokyo, Amory Horton. I'm sure we'll catch up on all the episodes. Don't ruin it for me. I, <laughs> you too. <laughs> That's too. Let's, uh, the word I heard there, seriously, Amory, was the president of the United States using the dreaded H word, hope. What does he hope for? Well, obviously, this meeting today is going to be an important one. And if you look at the months-long debt negotiation, it's a pivotal one because no one else is there. uh, McConnell's not going to be there. Schumer's not going to be there. Uh, Kim Jeffries is not going to be there. This is Biden and Speaker McCarthy. These two men are the ones that are going to be able to get the deal done. Uh, What is interesting about the phone call that took place as the president was heading back to the United States from Japan on Air Force One was that it then broke this impasse for the negotiators to then get back in the room on the Capitol for a few hours. So I really think what's important today is just we wait and see the communication that comes out of this meeting and if there is going to be a deal. And then we can get into also how difficult whatever deal these two men cut is going to be for them to also get through Congress because obviously Kevin McCarthy has a very slim majority in the House, but then also the Democrats have a very slim majority in the Senate, and both of the wings of both of these parties are not going to like a lot that is going to get done if it's going to be a proper negotiation. A completely unfair question, Anne-Marie, with you in Tokyo, but I'm going to go there because you're so read in. How much is Mr. McCarthy right now like Mr. Boehner? How close on the order and measurement is he to being an exiting speaker? So I think everyone has misjudged him in this moment only because everyone was pointing back to how long it took him to get the speakership. That was the 15 rounds of voting. 
And yes, it was very slim how he was able to get through with 217 votes. Um, his bill that he's using as leverage to get Biden to negotiate. And the last person to vote for that, by the way, was George Santos, potentially a, a, a member of Congress that won't be in his camp at some point, given the ethics review on that individual. But at the end of the day, he was able to keep his caucus secured. Many say that there, he's been very informative with his caucus about what needs to get done. And at this moment, he was able to bring Biden to the table. Biden said he wouldn't negotiate on this. Now, the White House continues to almost do verbal gymnastics, and they pain themselves to say, we're not negotiating on the debt ceiling, we're negotiating on the budget. But they wouldn't be negotiating on the budget at this moment if Speaker McCarthy said, I am not passing debt ceiling bill if I do not have fiscal spending cuts. So it wait to be, we have to wait and see how this uh, works out. But so far, he really does seem to have the support of his party behind him. MH, we're all super, super tired of the mood music headlines of the last week or so. Can you help us out with the substance? Where have we actually made some real progress? So there's one real um, point of progress on the Republican coming inside. They wanted spending caps for 10 years. It does seem like they're able to narrow that to potentially around six. Um, Things like co unspent COVID funds, I think Democrats uh, will get on board with. But, Jonathan, really, it's the top-line figure on spending and what baseline. And that's what the president was getting at in response to my question. He said he is willing to cut spending. Speaker McCarthy says they cannot spend more next year. They actually need to spend less next year than they did this year. What the president is saying, he's willing to cut spending, but he wants revenue raises. Now, Speaker McCarthy, in an interview with myself, said his two lines are, I will not raise taxes and I will not pass a clean debt ceiling. So the issue they have now is going to be how much they are willing to spend next year and from what baseline that's coming from. Um, and if they're able to hammer that out today, that would be key. The other big debate, of course, is going to be work requirements. Uh, the Democrats do not want to see work requirements, especially when it comes to access and health care. But this is important to a large chunk of Speaker McCarthy's caucus. I feel like this is like a Peanuts cartoon where when the adults speak, you just hear wah, 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 wah. And that's like the debt ceiling debate. Basically, every time it's like <laughs> this, this, and then everyone just kind of nods off. Is there a greater likelihood of default after this weekend's turmoil or not? I, I guess that is, you know, the people who you speak to, the experts, what do they say on that front? Well, everyone has a probability, right? The prob there used to be probabilities in the past that, oh, it's a 10% chance we can default. That has grown for a lot of asset managers I've spoken to, and they are developing contingency plans. I think what was telling was Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen on NBC News' Meet the Press reiterating what she also said to me, which is at some point we would default on something if we are past that date. And I think potentially this White House is going to have to start make actually thinking of the contingency plans. Are you going to just service debt? Will you serve it? Will you pay off Social Security recipients? Um, and Janet Yellen made it pretty clear that she thinks June 1 is a hard deadline. So that potentially is getting some people a little bit more nervous. But I do think very much so for the markets, it's probably a wait and see mode at this moment to hear what the president and McCarthy has to say, because these are the individuals that hold the power in the negotiation. Would you like the final word on the hybrid dress sneaker? And then we'll leave it there. Uh, yes, Amory Horton was authority on this. <laughs> so my personal, my personal opinion on sneakers in the White House is it is definitely a no. There we go. That's the official word. I think that's like that's the Bloomberg. That's why we love her. That's the Bloomberg lead now. She goes, on, you know, on, on Monday, she's <laughs> Chanel, and then, you know, never love her. What is speaking of McCarthy and Hakeem Jeffries doing there? You know. I mean, come on, Bramo. What are they doing there? It, it, it's ridiculous. Well, okay, I was looking. At, I think it's a little much of a stretch to call it a fashion hate crime, which is what some headlines were saying. In is, that what, is that what they called it? Someone called <laughs> it a fashion hate wow. crime, which is pretty intense. Yeah, that was the free beacon. John, help uh, me with culture. the socks. I mean, come on. you, uh, you John, just, you're, you you're a can't. pro at socks. I wear boring maroon socks. I wear the socks King Charles wears. What are those socks? If you want to wear like fancy dress socks, you've got to do it with a pretty sort of elegant suit and nice elegant footwear to go with it. I mean, that just that's just a no. I, I That's agree. a hard no from me. Okay, there are two on things. Radio, Thank you, people everybody. are driving off the road well, on radio well, right now. <laughs> two things. Respect is really important. Agreed. And if it's seen as disrespect, that is a problem. 
if it's just simply a fashion choice, they should be focused on other things like having this nation not default. <laughs> Agree. Do you know what my mother used to call it? Do you know, thanks for that. Do you know what my mother really used stuff. to call it? <laughs> What's that? Too? American <laughs> slob. Yeah. That oh, you go phrase. that far. Wow. Oh, Mike, she was. Brutal. Uh, she was scathing. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. a proper review, that is. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. yeah. That's up there. That's up there, TK, with GQ. Who yeah. just called this awful. Yeah. Awful. <laughs> Terrible. All right, guys. Live from New York City, counting you down to the open and battle about two hours away. Here's the tone of things right now on the S&P 500. Just a bit soft and negative, lower by 0.1%. I keep saying it, no real drama. The drama on Capitol Hill continues later. I can't even take that seriously. <laughs> None of us can. The debt scene and negotiations pick up once again. We've had headline after headline about the mood music. Let's talk about real numbers. As of late last week, I think this data from Thursday, the Treasury's cash balance was at just over $57 billion. $57 billion down from 140 yeah. the week before. TK, that's what you've got to track. Not the move music, totally the numbers. Totally agree. Where is it now? Do we know where it is now? And the answer is it's south of 50. I mean, that's the trend that's in place. Feels that way. As you know, Tom yeah. can be really lumpy because of tax receipts, but ultimately it's yeah. heading in one direction, and that's uh, lower. Over the last what, week. what time do they meet today? Actually, that's important. I haven't got time on that yet, Bramo. Have you got their one day yet? Their day starts at 12 noon. Their day starts at 12 noon. I think the president had a long flight back from Japan, oh, so yeah. we'll you see imagine? when that gets started. You, wow. In the bond market, two-year, 10-year, 30-year, six straight days, six consecutive days of yields higher. Take a break from that this morning. We're down two basis points on a two-year to 4.2451. The euro against the dollar, that currency pair negative for two consecutive weeks over the last couple of weeks and trying to bounce 108.19. So just getting its head above 108, Tom, in the last 24 hours or so. Was, yeah, watching currencies, first thing I looked at today, as I mentioned, copper going south here, and I looked at renminbi, which is sustained at 7.03%. Uh, I looked at euro Swissy just to see the dynamic there, and the answer is between the euro dynamic and the yen dynamic, 138.10, it is that same collared feel that we talked to Goldman Sachs about in the equity market. Breaking out above the top end of that range in the last yeah. week or so, the last couple of days. And Lisa, responsible for that breakout has just been a handful of these booming tech names. Which really gets uh, thrown into question a little bit with respect to the tensions between the U.S. and China that were thawing when President Biden called that silly balloon that basically that China floated above the U.S., simply a, a roadblock in getting something. And then China came out and said that they were going to uh, ban Micron from selling certain uh, cyber uh, cybersecurity aspects, certain chips, because they did not pass a cybersecurity review. And Micron shares are down 4.4 percent, dragging down the entire sector with it. AMD down 1.4 percent in pre-market trading. Qualcomm 1 percent. NVIDIA, which reports earnings later today, uh, down eight-tenths of a percent after a 114 percent gain so far this year. To me, this is one of the key questions, right? I don't have a read on what's going on between the U.S. and China. The mood music coming out of G7 was some sort of hardening in terms of a line, in terms of the communique that they put out with respect to China and their anti-competitive practices. But then also you heard some different rhetoric from Biden. Then you heard the Micron issue. Are, they, are the Chinese uh, officials going to start going after U.S. companies, international companies, in a more aggressive way? And how much does that change the picture for potential risk for even investors who are looking to buy uh, and, or not and, buy? And the confusion there, as you mentioned, is the president, because the president's comments were completely opposite of a lot of the rest of the zeitgeist. Well, I think what Anne-Marie said about Mike Pyle was really important, which is you can say, OK, we're going to reduce uh, competition. We're going to reduce some of the interlocking relationship between the U.S. and China, except that trades at a record between the two nations. So how exactly are going to do that without torpedoing the entire business model of a whole swath of U.S. companies? And that tension is really coming out in a, a rather, I don't know, I would say, hard to understand or less clear kind of message from the White House. I think Western politicians have completely let the public down repeatedly over the last two decades on this issue. They've been sleepwalking into it. Sleepwalking into it. The idea that we had to have President Trump make this one of the big issues and everyone came out and criticised him at the time. Have they changed the policy? Have the tariffs uh, been rolled nope. back? Nope. Nope, no. they haven't. And actually, people are actually saying 
we need to harden the line. And that's one of the bipartisan agreements. I think within the culture wars of America, this borders on a religious experience for a small group of people in America. And you see it, John, as we heard earlier, 20 percent of income comes from government, comes from Social Security, yeah. comes from uh, the medical system. And where does that where do those funds go? And it makes for a stew of Republican politics, which uh, everybody has to deal with, including Speaker McCarthy. But those two issues, Tom, you're right. Forget the mood music, forget the rhetoric, forget the tone. Yeah. Follow the numbers. The trade relationship the is numbers. massive. The Treasury cash balance is getting lower. They can yeah, talk up and, and down the debt talks all they want. They've got to get something done. And, and within the mortgage rate going from 6.x% to 7.04%, which is a rich person's uh, discussion, I would just look at the interest payments on our debt modeled out at $600 billion and modeled to do a double and even more out X number of years. All of a sudden, you know, we talk about cash, triple leverage all cash fund. I could have two quarters of a 2 and 20 payout on that. It's it's kill I'm not You're doing, doing well. No, the gross yield is not 15%, but it's like a 13.2%. That's before fees. In all seriousness, yeah. I think people are really frustrated with this issue. They always conflate the debt ceiling issue with debt sustainability. And of course, there's a relationship, but ultimately, the debt ceiling is just that. It's just something that's a real big distraction. They get to fight with each other, they get to follow their talking points, but ultimately, when they get into power, what happens? Very little. Very little happens. In fact, a whole lot happens, actually. The debt gets a whole lot well, bigger. And that's what's happened repeatedly from administration and, to administration, from administration to administration. And the most important headline last week, buried, I think it was on Friday now, we were all brain dead, was John Williams of the New York Fed at the law box uh, uh, s s saying that r starred would stay low. If you have a low r starred you have the convenience of growth saving the day. I mean, it's as simple as that. What do we got here on the deck? Well, here's the take from Sabadra Jepra Sokgen. We remain neutral on rates, <coughs> risk to yields are more balanced over the near term. A speedy resolution to the debt ceiling, although not our base case, would argue for modestly higher yields in the context of continued strength in the data. Now, TK, that's what we've had. I think, relatively speaking, now, we've had some decent data. And uh, what's so important here is first-order academics on statistics and central limit theorem. Sobrata Rajapa uh, joins us now. Without question on debt, our conversation of the day, head of U.S. rate strategy at the Derivative Force, Societe uh, General. Uh, Sobrata, I'm going to cut to the chase and go a little bit mathy here. In the equity markets, we talk about a collar. Maybe even in commodity markets, we talk about a collar trend of copper, live cattle, whatever. What is your world like when the two-year yield is collared? How do you respond to a banded trade on yield in the derivative space? So basically, uh, you point as you pointed out, John. I mean, uh, Tom, you have uh, you know ten, all yields across the the curve in the treasury market have been very range bound. You're looking at a range for uh, for two years around four percent, maybe four and a quarter to three seventy five. Uh, same with tenure as well. It's been in a very, very tight range. So really what that tells me, broadly speaking, is that there's really no strong conviction in the market on yields going either, um, you know, monotonically higher or, or lower, uh, broadly speaking, because of the fact that we're stuck between a rock and a hard place. In some respects, the data that we've gotten so far has been very, very strong. Uh, the consumer is resilient. The employment picture is, is relatively strong. Inflation is sticky. That would all argue for much higher yields from year on. But then you have the debt ceiling overhang, the regional banking crisis, uh, as well as rates being uh, policy rates being high and, and sticky. That would argue for, for perhaps right. lower yields over the longer run. So we're kind of stuck in this range because of that. When you are stuck, can you model out for higher, in, in the case of where we are in the range right now, can you model out a bet for higher yield and lower price? It's, it's hard because ultimately what you're looking at, especially in this environment, is for the Fed to pause. Uh, we're not talking about perhaps a pause, uh, a skip, and then uh, a, another hike later on this year perhaps. All that means is that if policy is going to remain restrictive uh, for the remainder of the year, then that would mean ultimately that uh, you're going to see a slowdown in the economy. That's uh, kind of what the Fed wants to achieve in order to bring down inflation. And that will ultimately mean lower yields. So, um, you know, we have a recession penciled in for early 2024. The economy looks relatively robust up until that point on. But then once we do go into a recession, 
the Fed's going to have to cut rates. So the ultimate destination is perhaps for, for, for lower yields. The path between here and there is uncertain, given the fact that you have a lot of dynamics to get through over the, the short term as well as the medium term. So, Badri, you mentioned the regional banking crisis is potentially helping to drive down inflation. What regional banking crisis? It seems like it's stabilized. We seem to swing between it not existing, not having ever percolated, and suddenly still being a full-blown issue that's going to help the Fed. Which is it? So the regional banking crisis, broadly speaking, the headlines have definitely uh, abated. Uh, you're seeing a little bit more stability in the in the banking sector. But broadly, the transmission mechanism from the regional banking crisis is going to come from the credit crunch or tighter uh, credit conditions. It's going to come from a greater regulation, if you will, of both the smaller uh, mid-size as well as uh, the larger banks. That would, broadly speaking, would tighten credit conditions as we progress through the year. You're seeing uh, mortgage rates start to rise. You're seeing real yields uh, at around 1.4%. So that's also risen in the last few weeks. So, so broadly speaking, I think higher yields as well as uh, you know tighter regulatory framework uh, it should lead to tighter credit conditions over the remainder of the year. So yes, it not, might not be a crisis in the regional banking sector as of now, but that but the tighter credit conditions c conditions are here to stay. Do you believe that right now that's going to uh, perhaps constrain yields going forward, that that's really the key feature, the H-8 uh, reports that come out on Friday that determine really what that band is that yields can trade within? Yeah, I think over the near term, yields are definitely constrained. Uh, you're probably uh, going to see an environment where the two years is going to struggle to get past the four and a quarter percent because that would imply the market uh, pricing out a lot of the cuts that are priced in, perhaps even starting to price in for hikes at upcoming meetings. That doesn't seem to be in the cards. Powell seems to be squarely in the, ta in the, in the camp of pausing uh, rates, at least in the June meeting, and then taking it meeting by meeting thereafter. Uh, so in that sort of context, I think two years are going to struggle to rise meaningfully from here. And as far as the long end is concerned, it's much more pegged to the outlook for growth, not just in the U.S., but also globally. China has had a good year this year for, for, for growth. GDP is going to be positive. But again, for upcoming years, you're looking at a meaningful slowdown in not just U.S., but also global growth. That should kind of keep the long end pegged and then ultimately decline over the coming uh, you know, months as well as uh, next year. More Fed speak through today. Can't wait. Bullard Bostick daily. Speaking throughout this morning and this afternoon. Savadra, thank you. Savadra Jaffa there of Sokgen. This in overnight. Savita Subramaniam of Bank of America, 23 year end price target. TK, you picked up on this one, 4,300. That's upgraded from 4K. Up from 4K and up from a much more bearish take a number of months before. Uh, she's the best at ESG mathematics, and they've shifted to a. I'm sorry, that's a bullish take from Bank of America. That and adjustment. She prefers the cyclicals and the equal weighted S&P. We'll keep building on that. Joining us in a moment are the banks, Chris Maranak of Jenny Montgomery Scott from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with the news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. President Biden and Republican House Speaker Kevin McCarthy are set to meet today for talks on averting a catastrophic U.S. default as time runs short and key differences remain. Negotiations have been whipsawed between progress and deadlock for days as the two sides simultaneously grapple for political advantage and a deal. Handpicked negotiators met Sunday evening at the U.S. Capitol. China has questioned the sincerity of the Biden administration as it pushes to resume high-level diplomatic talks with Beijing. A Chinese foreign ministry spokeswoman saying, quote, the U.S. side asks for communication on the one side, yet on the other, suppresses and contains China by every possible means. President Biden says he expects ties with China to improve very shortly, dismissing an alleged spy balloon that caused a diplomatic spat earlier this year as, quote, silly. SpaceX launched four private astronauts en route to the International Space Station, including the first woman from Saudi Arabia to travel to space. The crew lifted off atop a Falcon 9 rocket Sunday evening from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The mission, operated by Axiom Space, is the second of four human spaceflight launches that SpaceX is set to handle for the company. Axiom has plans to build its own private space station in the future. 
global news powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. It's very hard for banks to compete with deposits when money market funds are giving you, you know, 5%, 5 and a quarter. And if the Fed continues to raise rates, I think that gap continues to be wide. So I think the regional banks are still in trouble, not so much because of massive outflows, but their entire business model, if they're funding from the Fed at 5%, it's very hard to fund your assets, which you bought at 2%. Priya Misra of TD Securities, the head of global rates on interest rate strategy and looking ahead to the Fed talk through this morning and beyond into Fed Minutes on Wednesday. TK's just overwhelmed by Bullard, Bostick and Daly speaking a little bit later. This is like the minutes. Logan tomorrow. <laughs> Waller on Wednesday just ahead of those Fed Minutes. All exciting stuff. In the equity market, totally unchanged. That's exciting too on the S&P 500. We go absolutely nowhere. We've been going somewhere finally though. A break of 4,200 on the S&P 500. That really tightly, well-defined trading range of the year so far. Breaks to the upside. I remember Anastasia Amoroso of iCapital, Tom Sangus, to us a few months ago that that's how she expected this to break and that's basically what's materialised hey, in the last week. The bulls got to take a victory. Everybody's rationalised this enough. I understand we're at a collar, et cetera, and there's four stocks leading the way, whatever. But the people that said have courage to be in the markets they look like geniuses on this May Day. Totally. The bearish view might make a whole lot of sense but it's not working. You heard it again this morning from Mike Wilson, Morgan Stanley well, the staff take it, JP Morgan yes. I imagine you hear it from Marco Kalanovic later yes. from JP Morgan too. Just wait. Well it sounds good, just wait sure but you've had six months of missing out on a pretty decent rally. What was that expression again that if you're late you're wrong? That basically, if you're you know, late, if you're yeah. late, you're wrong. Well, I, I think I, the, the emotion is FOMO is too is too simplistic. It's not about FOMO. It's about <laughs> it's not aimed at you, Framo. It's not personal. <laughs> like if you're late, it's wrong. Mm. You know, you've missed. I it. understood. Yeah, yeah. I, okay, lots of people fine. did. They said the first but, six months of this year dip, and then we were going to rip. Except we ripped. The up technical front. reality of a bear market is you get lots of what are called intermediate bull market trends. Is this an intermediate bull within a long-term bear market? And then, you know, we, there's a lot of different opinions on that. So there is uh, to it. Uh, Christopher Marinak joins us now, director of golf at Jenny Montgomery Scott. He's not here to talk bank stocks. He's here to talk. We saw Oak Hill in the PGA this weekend, and you, like, live next door to Augusta as well. Very cool. I mean, give us a, a little vignette here after this spectacular weekend of golf, including a hole, hole in one by the PGA Pro from California. Give us a, 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 a picture of your Augusta. What's it look like? Oh, it's the prettiest place on earth. But it's also a golf course that actually gets totally taken apart in the summertime. So when they close next week, they'll be closed for three, four months, and they'll take the entire place apart and redo the greens, redo a lot of things, certainly fix yeah. up a few trees that fell uh, back in April. But it's, it, a, uh, it's, it's an incredible uh, piece of property. It may be a place to relax when, uh, when you're, you're dealing with the bank stocks as well. Are you at any point a master's relaxation about the banking crisis? Or is it still very vivid on a, on a, a Monday morning? Well, it's early innings. Uh, we have a lot to go. I mean, we still have a recession to find and then real estate uh, to work through. And the banks, I think, will continue to make money throughout this whole journey. But they certainly have issues to deal with the next three years. It seems like... The move is toward greater uh, greater capital requirements. We're hearing that right. from Neil Kashkari today, and we got right. a little hint of that today sure. from the J.P. Morgan Investor Day. Uh, right. What did we hear from them? Well, J.P. Morgan talks about their fortress balance sheet all the time, so you know their slides are are no different this morning about that. I think their uh, leadership position in the banking industry is second to none, and so they're going to continue to remind everybody that capital is king. The stress tests come out in about a month, and my sense is the Fed's going to pass uh, most, if not all, the banks, but they're going to politely ask for more comfort capital and require banks to raise additional equity. Uh, Which banks? I think the banks in the stress test, and then that will get pushed down to regional banks. So, you know, the, the, pretty much the rules work that anything that happens at the top 20 banks will get pushed down to the next 20 and the next 20. So it kind of falls from the top down. We talk about the potential for uh, just profitability constraints within some of the regional banks. How much will the profitability be further constrained and their lending mechanisms be curtailed if there is greater capital requirements foisted on them by the Fed? Well, capital is going to naturally improve for the banks because of retained earnings. 
and I think there's a slight comeback on on their um, equity securities just because you have natural amortization and payoffs of their uh, HTM and available for sale securities. The challenge is going to be that raising additional capital to cover what could be a future credit cycle in 24 and 25. That's why the capital, I think, goes up. We still have those unrealized losses that are not going to go to zero. They're just going to get incrementally better. Should, but the, pe should people buy individual stocks, ETFs, BKX? What, what's the intelligent way to play this three years out? Well, I think a basket of stocks across all market caps makes sense. It's not just the large cap. I think looking at mid cap and small community banks makes a bunch of sense. A lot of those are even cheaper than the regional banks that have been hit. Uh, my sense is that there is a real opportunity in these companies, many of which are trading below tangible book value and tangible book value is growing. Every now and again, TK and I take a stroll up Park Avenue. Bramo doesn't like to be with us publicly. And when T and I walk up... This is pretty it's public, true. guys. It's true. Just well, saying. Well, I mean, like, on air, but not outside <laughs> of the building. We go up Park Avenue and we go past the First Republic. On the next corner, the next block, is a Chase private client, almost immediately. Sure. And on those screens in First Republic, they're playing Bloomberg. And I often always think of them because, you know, right now we're talking about them and they're looking up at those screens and they're watching us talk about them. Can you tell me what's going to happen with those branches? Does anyone know? I think they'll stay the same for probably a year or two and quietly change gears, maybe become a second J.P. Morgan office, maybe they'll become something else. Uh, most likely it's going to be a slow play. You don't think they're just going to immediately come out with a knife and just cut all these branches and close them? I don't think so. They gave expense guidance this morning that's the same that they had before, excluding the uh, uh, FRC. We heard from Janet Yellen that there is going to be more consolidation akin to that First Republic getting acquired by J.P. Morgan. How much more, and is J.P. Morgan still in the business of acquiring, or is it going to be sort of the other Bank of, uh, Bank of America, the other big banks? I think it might be nothing, actually. I think that the consolidation may have already happened because you have three banks that failed in, in March and April, and that represents about 4% of the assets for those big regional banks. You know, the interesting thing to me is if you look at the top 25 banks in the country, they represent two-thirds of the assets uh, in the FDIC deposit. So why do we need consolidation when you already have two-thirds held there? So I think the consolidation may be greater mid mid-size and smaller. So every analyst who comes on talks about the regional banking crisis as something Thing that's going to tighten credit conditions and actually help the Fed. Are you pushing back and saying that's not really the case because it's over? Well, I don't, I'm not sure the crisis really ever happened. I think we had mishaps in the month of March with these failed banks, but largely those were their own doing. I think the rest of the contagion that's been limited to PacWest, Western Alliance, both mm -hmm. of which seem to be stabilizing, PacWest has positive news out this morning on asset sales. I think that the rest of the industry is marching ahead. You know, we have seen deposit outflows in the industry for sure, and those may continue just because interest rates need to catch up for, for depositors. But most of these banks are lending money, making uh, a profit, and m m marching forward. So I think there is credit, credit or tighter credit anyways, but it's not as bad and as, as negative as I think uh, headlines have suggested. The heritage of Jenny Montgomery Scott is Philadelphia, the mid-Atlantic states, and all the roll-up there that happened 30, 40 years ago in Bay. When do the regionals finally act and consolidate? Waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. When do they finally say enough? Well, you could see two or three mergers in the next couple of years, so those regional banks, but I'm not sure it's going to be that often. I really think it's going to be a lot less than we anticipate. The Fed has to really change gears at the examiner level to push these mergers. The last two years, mergers have taken forever to close, and a handful of them terminated. Just ask TD. It's a people thing, the examiners? Sure. Interesting. Absolutely. Interesting. Master's tickets. Have we nabbed that down? Yeah, Can we, we had. Chris is our new friend. Okay, good. <laughs> the odds, according to Golf Digest, thank you, Simon, for this, to garner master's tickets is a 1 in 200 One odds. in 200. That's, the, one that's in through 200. the lottery. The lottery, right. whatever they have. Okay. Yeah, I Just have to applied last people. year and went Got to know people, flames. Bramo. Do you know people? No. no. Okay. We know Christopher Marinak. <laughs> but Chris knows people. He knows people that we know. That's good to know. He well, yes. Well, it's good to know you, Chris. Thanks for being with us. Chris Marinak, Jenny Montgomery Scott, will be in touch. Our um, new best friend. <laughs> early in Q1 next year, going into the Masters. Some hot tickets at Monte Carlo, Tom. You've seen the, the Monaco F1 tickets. Yeah, we've got to remember, oh. John, this is off these horrific floods two weeks ago in Italy. Really, really damaging and, and way too much death floods. So 
it's somewhat of a celebration of F1 to restart today. And, you know, I, I just I think we've got to keep an American heritage here to Bloomberg surveillance, which means, you know, Grand Banks 85 in the harbor. Is that a nice boat? Good American trawler. Yeah, it's, Do you think it's that, American. Does it's that not, fit in well in Monaco? It, it, it would be like, who are they? Because it's American. It's got an American okay. line to it. It's got right. a, it's a different line. Than, okay, well, I'll have, you know, to, I'll have the, to take a look at that. Do you know that Monaco has uh, the highest top 1% Top one percentile of earners. I saw that. We did a Bloomberg story on it. We did. And yeah. it's like, what is it? Like $19 million of what is, income? What does it take to be in the top 1%? Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was something insane it the, in Monaco. <laughs> John, seriously. <laughs> More than you'll it, ever have. Is it the Monaco most did. narrow streets all year? Oh, for the racing? Yeah, for the races. Oh, yeah, classic street race. Classic street I remember race. being afraid of the classic James Garner movie. That's very like, cool. Afraid of it. There's a great scene, 2006, Kimi Raikkonen driving for McLaren. Car blows up gets out and he goes to his yacht and watches the rest of the race from his yacht. It's fantastic. Yeah, that's what I do. It's fantastic. You know, that's a different life, isn't it? I mean, that's just a different life. Lisa Hornby of Schroeder's on the Fed coming up. There's this kind of tension in the market. It is a very, very narrow advance in the stock market. There is a risk here of people really capitulating to the upside. The market's not pricing in a recession, far from it. I think the market's pricing in normalization. We're now talking about investing for 2024, looking over the horizon of the slowing economy to what the market will look like next year. And that's really what's going on in the markets right now. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keen on Merger Monday. Thank you for being with us on radio and television. And when there's stress out there, what do you do? You mate. Mizuo of Japan takes out Green Hill of New York. This is Scott Bach and Mark Lasky. And this is what we're going to see the rest of the year. I mean, the merging here. I can't. We're going to see it the when rest of the year. When there's stress out there, you mate. That's you what see. we're doing. I'm sorry. It's a great roll up here. Divine and you see wait. it with Green Hill being taken out by Mizuo. Oh, okay. I'm going to save this and go through these headlines. Not the first U.S.-Japan banking tie-up alliance, if you the, want to call it that. Yeah, yeah. Reporting from Shinali Basak, they're forging further into U.S. investment banking through this deal for Green Hill. We've got a price, Tom? $15, $15 a share. $15 a share. $15 a share. This so is... five fifty million, including debt. Yeah, what's interesting to me is that Scott Bach, ex Morgan Stanley, and Mark Lasky, who was at Goldman Sachs, and it's another one of these bolt ons. And you say, well, why is this happening? And I'm going to go back to the heart of the matter that we talk on each day. All of a sudden, money costs something. And that is a catalyst for mergers. It's also a catalyst for being too big to fail. And this, to me, is sort of the interesting uh, emergence from this not crisis or whatever you want to call it, what you have is you get profitability from being bigger. And so after decades of people saying banks should be smaller, banks should be more diversified, all of a sudden, bigger banks are more Scale. successful, bigger yeah. companies are more successful. And that's really what you're going to see more and more of. One more deal across the Bloomberg, Tom. Chevron to buy PDC Energy, $72 a share, all stock deal. That's just crossed the wire <clears throat> well, just a, now. And, and it's important here. This is not the zombie roll-up. I mean, these are companies that are really quite good. But, again, it's this urge for scale that Lisa uh, mentions. I believe we were doing this uh, seven days ago, Merger Monday uh, last week, where there were two transactions. I believe the sum was $38 billion between the two. So it's in the air. There's some confidence to get yeah. deals done. And, Tom, overall, more broadly, the economic data is looking pretty resilient relative to expectations. Yes. Which is why I think we've changed the language around June away from pause to perhaps skip with considering with consideration that maybe they come back into the mix and hike rates again. I can just see <clears> Tom's <throat> face as you say this. Skip. Please stop, this. Bram. I'm just trying to stay serious after the way you opened <laughs> yeah. that program. In times of stress, you made. I you mean, basically. Okay. That's what they're doing. I mean, yeah. you're going to see much, much more of this. <laughs> Still don't know what's making us laugh, do you? All right, carry on. 4.26% in the two-year uh, yield. And I'd also point out, John, with the equity markets where they are, the bears, you mentioned a couple hours ago, Mike Wilson and others, yeah. restructuring a bear market view you where others are capitulating into the optimism you see from Green Hill and no, Mizuho as they mate. An all-time classic, that was. <laughs> Let's get to the price action on the S&P 500. <laughs> Equity futures on the S&P. Let's keep it together. Positive by 0.1%, just about. Yields higher by, let's call it a single basis point, Tom. 
368 on a 10 year. And also, I uh, noticed as well the dollar here churning. John, you mentioned earlier 108.22 on euro. It's not giving us much information, but it's something worth watching. And commodities, John, we've under chatted. The answer is commodities are persistently weaker, and we're over the weekend. I've been talking to the team at John Hancock about this. They're not all behind that cyclical story. So let's just quickly go back. Rewind a couple of steps. Savita Subramaniam's upgraded the outlook for yeah. the S&P 500. Much more constructive on the equal weight S&P. So you strip out the muscle <clears> of right. big tech. Likes the idea of the cyclicals picking up again. Mm. Are we getting that kind of validation from the commodity market from places like copper mm. right now for global cyclical impulse? I would say no. No, not I would seeing not. that. Let's go to a guest here right now to give us perspective here with all the different news flow. We have Lisa Hornby's head of U.S. multi-sector fixed income at Schroeder's. Oh, the yield move that we have lifted up, does it take us up to a collar edge, yields up to resistance, or is there something going on here, Lisa, that's original? You know, I think the market is still flirting with this idea of are, is there a path where things can actually be okay? And certainly resolution on the debt ceiling, which was last week's optimism or cause for optimism, is a step towards that path. Um, of course, I think we'll be we'll have some fits and starts between now and then, and I, I don't think we'll see the highest end of the, the ten year range where the, the the peaks that we got to last year. Um, but I think you know I think there could be some tactical trading opportunity here for sure. What are you doing on duration? We hardly touched on it this morning. Not so much the price move or yield move, but the bet you place in maturity. Yeah, you know, I think duration, I think, look, the outlook for bonds in our view this year has been compelling. Um, I think we're 10 years, we're probably looking at a range of 325 to 375. So we're getting towards that upper band. Um, we like tactically trading, but erring towards being long because our view is for economic deterioration. It's kind of a slow burn, um, but I think that that's where we're headed. And so we want to be we want to come out the other side of this long, but understanding this is going to be a volatile market as it really has been for the last four or five months. Elisa, where are you seeing that signs of economic deterioration at the moment? So certainly a slow grind, but we are starting to see it on the consumer side. Um, it's it's obviously very gradual, but we have seen credit card balances tick up. We have seen on the auto loan side, um, now really across the FICO spectrum, um, a bit of deterioration. Obviously, jobs still remain very, very resilient. Um, you know, one of the things we're watching, though, closely is small businesses. You know, small business surveys have really deteriorated over the last, uh, I want to say, more than a year. Um, and, and that deterioration, in our view, is probably set to increase as credit conditions tighten for these guys, particularly in light of what's going on on the regional banking side. So, that's where we're focused. I mean, we have to remember small businesses in the U.S. employ a very large percentage of the population. You know, we spend a lot of time talking about the GEs of the world, but probably 90 percent of the businesses in the U.S. are small, um, small to midsize. So their their outlook is pretty important, and it's not particularly compelling when you look at the data. We just had Chris Marinak on over uh, from Jenny Montgomery Scott, and he was talking about the regional banking crisis that wasn't. Uh, and so I wanted to get your sense of what is happening in terms of the credit tightening. He said that regional banks are a much better position than people assume. They're not constraining uh, their lending mechanisms all that much. Do you see something different, or do you think it just hasn't happened yet, but just wait and it will? I think it's a again, I think it's a bit of a slow burn, right? We you know, the cost of capital has gone up. These regional banks are under increased scrutiny. I think there will be more focus on balance sheet preservation um, and the type of loan making that they're doing. And I think certain pockets of the economy will see a little bit more stress as a result of that and make it a bit harder to access capital. I mean, Tom said it before. Uh, while I was listening in earlier, uh, the cost of capital has risen, and that poses an issue. And, the re and it's supposed to pose an issue, right? The Fed is doing this intentionally to try and slow economic growth, and they're doing it, but it, it takes some time. Given how resilient the economy has been, uh, has been, and given that we haven't really seen the credit stress materialize in a way as significant as many people had expected at this point, what is the risk that the Fed's going to have to tighten further? It's going to have to hike again, perhaps even in June, because maybe the constraint isn't that great from the regional banks just yet and that it will have to be the slow burn that goes on for a while. 
Yeah, I mean, the market is certainly flirting with that, right? We've seen the probability of a Fed hike at the next meeting move, you know, vary between 25 and 40 percent. I, you know, if we get a debt ceiling resolution in the near term, I wouldn't be surprised to see that move higher. I think the Fed wants to be cautious. I mean, if you heard, listen to Powell's comments last week, he didn't explicitly suggest a pause here, but he did allude to the fact that, hey, we've done a lot. We could potentially be patient and see what the impact is. I mean, they are breaking things, right? There are more, you know, look at the look at the move index and where it's been over the last year uh, versus the the previous several years. Things are starting to to, to percolate in the background, and we have had several banks now fail. Uh, I don't know that that story is completely played out. I, I think that they realize that you know, there are now some risks out there that are becoming a bit more serious. And so all else equal, I'm sure they would prefer to pause, but we have a lot of data between now and uh, the middle of June, their next meeting. So we'll we'll have to wait and see. Well, let's just finish there, Lisa. Clearly, you're not going to keep on hiking until you see 2%. Do you think we've seen sufficient evidence right now that they are sufficiently restrictive? Or is this a guess based on the cumulative tightening that they've already delivered? I think... It it's a great question. Uh, my sense is they've they've probably done enough. They might go a little bit further because they're lo they're looking at data on a lag. If we could fast forward six months from now, I said I suspect that inflation will continue to slow and that they will get you know be closer to their targets and growth will be starting to roll over in a more serious way. But you know if we get another five and a half percent inflation print, that all bets are off. Um, so I think, you know, we unfortunately, the way monetary policy works is with a lag. And so yeah. they'll react to the data as it comes in rather than, you know, six months or 12 months from now trying to see the bigger picture. Hey, Lisa, this was great. Lisa Hornby there, the Schroders. Appreciate it, as always. Tom, I think we often underplay this, just how much of an educated guess the Fed has taken at the moment. This isn't science. No, it's not science, it's theory. And the question is, is the theory there? I've been moving books around at home, and you look at the textbooks at home, how much of this is in the textbooks? I, I, I got too many people telling me it's in the textbooks. I'm like, no, it's not. We're out of a pandemic. The dynamics are there, including three tranches of Biden stimulus and Trump stimulus. And, it, it, you know, the cliche is it's original territory. It is. Which is the reason why data dependency is a little frustrating for all of us, because how do you depend on data <clears throat> that is giving an unreliable and backward looking metric of something that you don't really understand the parameters of? And I think that is the frustration with the Fed speak, because they're basically in this fishbowl without being able to see outside and try and give you guidance when we're all in the fishbowl. Data dependence, that phrase oh, kills me. It. Ah, it's the worst. <laughs> Can we get back it's to mating? Worst. Of course. I looked at Greenhill, and I haven't followed it very much, <clears throat> GHL, but I took a moving average study from 2010, John, when they were enjoying $80 per share. Yeah. They're down 82% with a $15 takeout from the glory days. Would you like to share that wisdom with our audience one more time? What happens when you get stressed? You said, you know, yeah, you have to mate. I mean, you know, that's all there is to it. You got to for the dinosaurs. Animal dinosaurs got to go out there and they got to get, uh, you know, they've got to do it. We're up 114 percent now, which is great. Okay, nice. But down from down from an 80 share price a long, long time ago and far away. So we've gone from the golf network to animal. Planet. It's like mutual of Omaha. Yeah. yeah. You know, wild kingdom. Progress. <laughs> the evolution. Michael O'Leary, CEO of Ryanair in the studio up next. Inside the mind of Tom Keen. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Bloomberg has learned Mizuho Financial Group is forging further into its U.S. investment banking through a deal to buy Greenhill. Now, the Japanese banking giant agreed to buy Greenhill for $15 a share in an all-cash transaction, which values the firm at $550 million, including debt. Now, the firm said that Monday in a statement. The lender will retain Green Hill's leaders, including Chief Executive Officer Scott Bach. Ford CEO is pushing the company's plan to lift annual electric vehicle output for $2 million by the end of 2026 at an investor event in Michigan. Jim Farley tells Bloomberg the company is taking the fight in EVs to Tesla. They've had the market to themselves. They have a big head start, kind of like what we do on Pro. Um, and, and now they're seeing a lot more uh, pressure, obviously. Where we compete really in, in EV you know, pickup trucks, three row crossovers that we're gonna show people today, and uh, the, the commercial vehicle, EV commercial vehicles, 
we don't see a, as much price you know, competition because there's not as many vehicles choices there. You can watch Bloomberg's full interview with Ford CEO Jim Farley on the terminal and throughout the day on Bloomberg TV and radio. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. Live from New York City this morning, good morning to you and welcome to the program. This Monday morning, equities just about turning positive in the last 10 minutes on the S&P 500. Equity futures on the S&P positive now by 0.06%. And we'll see, TK, if we can add some weight to the rally last week on both the S&P 500 and on the Nasdaq too. We have to see. I mean, I mean, the, the market's moving and I'm sorry, I see a little lift here. And to me, John, it lifted off of the off of the takeout news. The one, two, three, four takeouts, including Chevron. Is Chevron just, getting just, a deal done? You know, tapes change here a little yeah. bit. Is no, getting a deal done? No question uh, about it. I, I mean, that's just all there is to it. John, you know, I'm flustered. I'm a father in America. What are you researching? And I'm researching, you know, the middle child goes over to Europe, and you realize that they're in school so that on the weekends they can travel places and have a life I never had. Mm. And you have the typical dad panic because in America to fly from Cincinnati to Fargo, North, you know, South Dakota, North Dakota is a ton of money. How about Edinburgh to Dublin, $26.63? That's great, isn't it? That's just one way. I mean, Ryanair. you know, Ryanair. I mean, you're all in, $52, $60. No Tom, bad. I used to fly to Bergamo out of maybe East Midlands or Stansted for 15, 15 quid, 15 pounds. Why don't you bring in the man that... that, that the man who was, made it happen the man that made is it responsible happen. for my vacations in Europe as a child. Michael O'Leary, CEO of Ryanair, joins us right now. Michael, great to see you in New York. <laughs> Good to see you, mate, as always. $15. It's not we bad, is it? So, Michael, tell me this. Is that the future still, or yeah. have things changed? Uh, it is the future, and things are, mar are, are changing. I mean, I think... You know, we've ordered another 300 aircraft from Boeing two weeks ago. So, you know, we're going to grow from 149 million passengers pre-COVID to 300 million passengers by the early 2030s. So there's still lots of growth for Ryanair. But growth is getting easier in Europe. The market has consolidated post-COVID. Uh, uh, capacity has come out. I mean, we're looking across Europe this summer where we're operating 25% more seat capacity than we had pre-COVID. But the rest of the market's only operating at about 90%. So we're taking huge amounts of market share from everybody else. We're still we're he well hedged on fuel. We're offering really low airfares. But those low airfares are, are up a bit. Like We expect our lowest airfare to rise uh, probably 5%, 10% a year for the next couple of years because of this capacity constraint. And with the, 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 the manufacturer's challenge, Boeing and Airbus, huge backlog on orders, can't increase uh, monthly production because of supply chain difficulties for the next four or five years. I think you're looking at a European marketplace that will now copy some of uh, America in the last decade, stable capacity and more reasonable pricing going forward. Is that good for you and bad for the people travelling? I think it's good for us. It's also good for the people travelling. But the challenge is, if you look at the German market this year, for example, Lufthansa, which was bailed out by the German government to the tune of 13 billion during COVID, they've only restored 80% of their pre-COVID capacity. Airfares in Germany have doubled this year over last year. So, you know, German consumers are being stiffed by their national champion and they're increasingly turning to us because we have capacity growth. I'm taking 50 aircraft a year from Boeing because we have capacity growth. We can keep fares down. But I have no doubt in my mind that one of the big drivers of Ryanair's growth in the next couple of years is going to be the incumbent legacy carriers really driving airfares much higher in Europe than they are in the US. Are you willing to then just have a commensurate increase in your, uh, in your price, just perhaps less? Absolutely not, Lisa. We're going to keep growing capacity. We're going to, we will remain load factor active, yield passive. We intend to take huge amounts of market share from every incumbent in Europe as we uh, grow our share in Europe from about 20% now to about 33% in the early 2030s. People talk about the travel boom that has really supported services globally as being a bit of YOLO. You only live once after the pandemic, get out there and travel. And 
If you're not dealing necessarily with the business segment as much, how confident are you that that's going to continue in perpetuity? Perpetuity is a long time. I mean, it's too long for my horizon. Next five years, it's going to continue. There's a couple of fundamentals in Europe. One, we're seeing very strong business growth. I mean, businesses are flying around Europe, particularly to kind of Eastern Europe, Morocco, Portugal, fix, repairing supply chains that they can no longer depend on Asia. And they're looking to cheap, find cheap manufacturing in Morocco, Portugal, Poland, Romania. We're the biggest airlines in those markets. So we're seeing a very strong recovery in our business travel. I think people who are locked up for two and a half years uh, are, are going back traveling, and that's not a short-term phenomenon. Travel increasingly. I mean, what really surprises me about the moment, for all the, the, the negative coverage of higher energy prices, price inflation, there's still fundamentally full employment in Europe. People are getting paychecks at the end of every month, and what they do is they go traveling. Mm -hmm. Leisure time is rising. You have kids who are all over Europe. I mean, when I grew up in the 70s and 80s, as my children remember, keep reminding me, that was the last century, we went around Europe by train. Thank you. You know, you're interrailing. Now they go around Europe on Ryanair. Uh, this really? summer, huge U.S. flows into Europe. The Asian market is recovering. But because only 90% of the pre-COVID capacity has been restored, demand is strong and pricing is strong. And I see no reason why that won't continue for a four or five year period. Now, there'll be curveballs, COVID, Ukraine invasions, things like that will throw right. us off course. But the underlying fundamentals are very strong. Demand for travel is strong. And supply is constrained by, by aircraft manufacturers. Uh, there's a cap on what they can build and uh, how, right. how fast they can increase production. I've got an aerospace team with a lot of really smart questions. Here's the only question our listeners and viewers care about. It looks like the U.S. airfares are a complete scam. I looked at a you know, quick eyeball, $60, $70 round trip on Ryanair versus $300 in the same flight in America, roughly. And I look at the margin you're making, $0.12 cents modeled on the dollar versus $0.06, $0.07 cents at, say, Kirby's wonderful United Airlines. Why can't America get this right? Why aren't you in America? One, because there's so much growth for us in Europe. Uh, why would I want to go to America uh, when we can, can deploy all of this growth in Europe? And Europe is still fundamentally underexploited. Europe is moving towards consolidation. I think the American airlines have slightly overplayed it. You know, we look at Southwest and, you know, Southwest was kind of heroic model for us when we first started this 30 years ago. But Southwest is no longer fundamentally a low cost airline. You know, its average ticket price is $110, $120 a seat. My average ticket price last year was €40 uh, Euros a seat. So I think, you know, more needs to be done. There, you know, More capacity needs to be found in the American industry. But the challenge is going to be for all of us, because Boeing and Airbus can't fundamentally increase uh, their production rates, we're going to be, this industry is going to be challenged for the next four or five years. And I think we have to be careful not to repeat what's happening in the States. We don't want to push pricing too high. And that's, I think, why our 300 aircraft order with Boeing is so key to keeping prices low and people travelling across Europe for the next decade. You could buy John. some capacity. You mentioned consolidation. You interested in that? No. I mean, you know, it's just you know, I'm buying somebody else's problems. Great. But I'm very happy in Europe to see Lufthansa buy Alitalia, let's see, IAG I, buy I, TAP. I you, you know, consolidate away. And you'll need to consolidate because none of you are going to be able, are able to compete with Ryanair because we have much lower costs than you, we have much lower fares than you, so you better well, but may as well great consolidate. Great balance sheet too. So if you don't want to play the consolidation game, you're sitting there with a great balance sheet, no debt right now. Right? No, no, we're, we, debt? we're paying debt down aggressively. Paying it down. We've no net debt. We're, we're zero net cash. No about. net debt. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, capital returns? I think it's coming, just not yet. I mean, we're paying down debt at the moment. I've paid two bonds this year, 1.5 billion of debt. I've only got about 2 billion of debt left. I paid that all down in 2025 and 26. I'm spending about two, just over two, two and a half billion a year in CapEx, which I'm funding out of internally generated cash flow. And once we get through that, uh, I think maybe next year, right. if we have another strong year and we have significant net cash balances, then we'll return those to shareholders. Ryanair, 26% debt, UAL, 70% debt. That's a big Difference, difference, isn't it? Just yeah. a massive difference. Yeah. This was fun, Michael. Got to do this more often. We do. I got to come back to the States more often. You see, Can you I've... bring your damn airline to the States? Lisa it's and I are happening. getting absolutely crushed. I want to know what the fares. secret is. I mean, why some people can offer $40 or 40, 40 euros. Double it. For... 80, 90. I mean, double it. 80, <laughs> 90 compared to 300. It's a ridiculous. You look through history. The Irish have always been, you know, we've been transport pioneers. We've built the roads, we've built the <laughs> railways, and now we're building the air. We're going to dominate the skies across Europe. Oh. Come to Europe for low fares. Don't bother holidaying in the States. 
States. Now, when you're back, we need oh, to boy. talk about a business traveller. I do wonder what's going to happen here. I remember EasyJet made a big transition years ago to get the business traveller and... I wonder if your cabin's going to change at all in years to come. Absolutely not. Over it's just going to remain body. the same? You're going to keep the same Look, thing? Business travel, in, what's different about it, people keep confusing short haul and long haul. What's different in short haul is nobody will pay a premium for business travel. Business just want on-time, affordable, safe transport. They want to get there. Long haul, 20% of the market will still pay a ludicrous premium on long haul, which is why long haul and short haul is different. And we intend to continue to grow very strongly in Europe with a huge growth in business travel as well as leisure travel out over the next decade. And I can only do that with my beloved airport, aircraft partners, Boeing, <laughs> yeah. who will now send me 400 <laughs> aircraft <laughs> over the next eight Monaco years. This weekend. No more sales pitch. Monaco I don't, this I, weekend. I, I, don't think, do I don't think they fly to Monte Carlo. I don't they fly to Nice and Marseille. There you we can drive across Perfect. the border. Perfect. From Take New York train. City, Michael, Guys, thank, thank you. Great, <laughs> great. Thank you, Thanks. buddy. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Surveillance, good morning, everyone. John Farrell getting ready for the next hour. Lisa Bramlett and I holding court here. We're going to get some, some good conversation on the market right now. There are many names at J.P. Morgan, some of them mentioned by Shanali Basic earlier. Congratulations, Shanali, on her reporting on Green Hill being taken out by Mizuho. The big pop, 100% lift in the stock there to get it to $15 a share. Uh, but the J.P. Morgan conference goes on now. Lisa, they signs of deterioration in economy. <laughs> no signs. What are they supposed to say? <laughs> no signs of deterioration in their net interest income. In fact, they upgraded it to $84 billion from the expected $81 billion. Uh, so they are making more money. And here's the question, right? As they look out, how much are they going to consolidate business at a time where there is this pressure with the J.P. Morgan CFO saying that they do expect the system-wide deposit outflows to continue? <gasps> From them, maybe less uh, than it, perhaps at some of the smaller institutions. I would suggest the managing the message here. And the message here and an important data check uh, this morning is there's a little bit of a bid to the market. We were red earlier, now green on the screen. Futures of four, now futures of 32. Uh, the VIX, not a 16 level, or dare I say the 15 print we saw in the enthusiasm Friday, but 17.08 to reset uh, here. And the yield is what I'm really looking at. And Lisa, I'm sorry, the two-year yield rounded up 4.28%. Can we begin to model out a 4.30% two-year yield on the way to 4.50? That would be game-changing. I don't feel any momentum anywhere in the macro <clears throat> trading. I see it in the micro stories. But on the macro side, everyone's gone to sleep waiting for the debt ceiling debate to be over, waiting for uh, some sort of new catalyst. Otherwise, why is anyone going to get really jazzed about anything and have too much conviction about one way or another. And conviction is going to be, as we mentioned earlier, in the job report and critically the inflation report before the uh, June Fed uh, meeting. I think one other insight here that we can say is the whole theme is about collars, about being within a range, somewhere above support, somewhere beneath resistance, depending on what you look at. Not in copper. Copper is not a collar trade. Copper is a weaker trade. Other than that, a lot of collars out there. Is that a macro story or is that a China <clears throat> reopening story? China, well, the partition, this is really important, folks. We'll do a lot more on this uh, uh, through the week. On China, I would suggest it's a domestic study versus a foreign study for China. And it looks like foreign maybe isn't happening, even though the domestic economy is doing OK. I'm, I'm, it's, I'm almost guessing there. That's what some but, people say. You know, and and so at what point, how does that factor into the commodity sector, perhaps, right. more than a, a broader uh, base deterioration? 7.03 yuan per dollar shows a, a renminbi weakness we've seen the last number of days. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to plunge into it right now. He's chief market strategist at Jones Trading, writing an afternoon letter that gets a huge attention. Michael O'Rourke joins us uh, right now. Michael, <laughs> what are you going to look for today to write this evening? What is the key thing you're <laughs> focused on on a Monday? Well, obviously, it's the debt limit negotiations. You know, um, or, I, you know, fits and starts is the best way to describe this process. And there's a lot of optimism Thursday and uh, obviously a lot of uh, right. Positive comments from both sides, only to call it quits. Uh, I think it was around 10 a.m., 10:30 a.m. Friday morning, so everyone could enjoy their weekend. Um, so obviously, negotiations will resume today, and right. I think the entire market's in this holding pattern, waiting for this situation to show some real progress. And yet, you and I have seen the market walk away from the bears. What is the character? 
of the day by day. I, grind is almost too much of a negative tone. The lift to the market that we see, what is that character? So you, you mentioned ranges a few minutes ago, and the S&P 500 had been this 4050 to 4175, 4200 range, and now we're pushing above that 4200. Yeah, the Nasdaq 100 make new 52-week highs last week. A bunch of, uh, I call you know the, the big mega cap stocks. I've I've gotten to call them the magnificent seven who are driving the S&P 500 gains for the year. Uh, four of them made new 52-week highs last week, and uh, again, this is people checking out of the market. And I think one thing that's definitely missed out there is that about 30% of the big of the S&P 500 names are op owned by passive uh, shareholders, indexes, ETFs, and things like that. That they're not sellers. And we've pumped so much liquidity in the market over the past several years that um, the pricing mechanism doesn't react uh, uh, you know, as efficiently as it once did. It's very slow to react, actually. So what we're seeing now is we're seeing this drift higher because people have checked out and there is not much going on, on the tape. And you just have the structural bid that underlies the market. And, you know, even though there's not a whole lot, there's not a lot of positives, if any positives out there in the market, we're seeing just multiple expansion as we drift up. And I think uh, you need more engagement by active investors to get real pricing out there. And until we get the debt ceiling uh, resolved or make some real progress here, you don't get, you don't see that. So you just have this slow drift higher. Do you think that there will be uh, some sort of catalyst to get the market not just to tread water the way it has been if the debt ceiling debate uh, gets resolved? Well, I think then you start shifting focus back to inflation, uh, where the economy's at. Um, as Tom mentioned, we'll have PC inflation at the end of the week. Uh, I don't expect much improvement there because CPI, you know, a couple of weeks ago did not show any improvement. But nonetheless, it seems to be we're set for the Fed to pause in June, and I would expect that to be the case. But as far as the economic slowdown that everyone's been expecting, including myself, it's taken much longer to play out, and we're still sitting here with matching six-decade lows in unemployment. So we're still going to we're going to shift back to the inflation uh, debate, and we'll you know that higher for longer. I think it's going to be even longer than anyone expected when we started this process, you know, over a year ago. You sound frustrated a bit, Michael, and you're not alone with respect to trying to understand how to play a macro story at a time of just such uncertainty. Is there a corollary for this moment? A corollary? I, I, I can't think of a corollary because I, I do think the the liquidity of the easy monetary policy, negative real Fed funds rate for most of the past, past 15 years all plays into this. I mean, it's funny. You were talking about the banks earlier and everyone, you know, people are talking about more bank capital and things like that. I mean, one of the biggest players here was the <clears> Federal Reserve <throat> pumping so much liquidity in the system that bank deposits went up by $5 trillion or 30 percent in the span of two years, 35 percent. Those banks had to put money to work. And what he, surprise, surprise, they made some bad investments. So there, there's two sides to this. And again, this is just something that's going to take a while to unwind. Michael, what's the value of cash here? And do you observe a lot of cash out there? I don't observe a lot of cash, but you, you talked about that two-year uh, yielding 4.3%. That, I think, is a very attractive investment in this environment if you want to be more defensive. Again, we're not seeing a lot of great uh, – your know, earnings season was a little better than, better than expected, but earnings are going to be down year over year. So if you don't want to bet on multiple expansion, you, you can go for the safety there. And again, we're entering this period of a, a positive real FUD funds rate <clears throat> after 15 years of mostly negative one. That should lead to a more challenging right. environment the second half of the year, early next year. Michael, thank you. Michael O'Rourke with us at Jones Trading here on a busy Monday uh, morning. Looking at the markets here, and again, highs of the day, a little bit of a lift, constructive futures up four uh, right now. Lisa, Merger Monday, I think we had Merger Monday last time, a little different character. That was, I, my recollection, that was a huge mining deal in Australia, like somebody bought all the gold that's out there. Yeah. And today it's finance guys in an oil company here or there. The finance one is interesting just simply because of some of the change that we've seen at the heads of a number of uh, banks and financial firms, whether it's the likes of Morgan Stanley on Friday, whether it's the likes of uh, what we saw with Peter Orzag going in and stepping up uh, over on the private right. equity space. 
Mizuho, though, buying Green Hill, really interesting as scale seems to matter that much more. It's going to be interesting to see. And the heritage here out of the great financial crisis is fascinating. So I remember the day that Jason Trenner left uh, Ed Hyman's shop, Evercore ISI now, and set up Strategus, or there was Evercore themselves, Roger Altman and, and others setting up. Every, every character was there. And then there was Green Hill. Boy, did they do well for a while. Shanali Basic joins us right now in a stock from 80 to 10 to 15. What did Green Hill get wrong for eight years? You know, that's a that's a, the question of the lifetime. This was the first really of its kind to go public. It set the stage for the Prella Weinbergs, the PJTs, everyone, exactly. Ken Molas to go public. They faced a lot of competition. That is competition on paying bankers for deals in one of the biggest boom cycles for mergers and acquisitions. And then they had already left the restructuring wave back in 2008 as well. So again, Green Hill, both on profitability, competition, as well as just winning share on deals. They've dropped off the league tables very significantly in recent years. This $15 a share per cash stock price, is, uh, you know, deal uh, price here, it was trading at 670 or so back on Friday. It's double, more than double what it was trading at very recently. So then the other question uh, is, why is Mizuho going for this? Well, you know what it does, remember Mizuho actually was not an m and investment bank. Mizuho has debt and equity capital markets and in recent years has been hiring m and bankers. So buying Green Hill gives it an immediate presence around the world in m and a And by the way, the bet here is that they already have a balance sheet. Okay, the elephant in the room yep. here is that Japanese banks have a history of getting into businesses right before uh, the economic cycle turns. I just think about 2006, 2007 with Mizuho getting into CDOs and all sorts of derivatives tied to them uh, and tied to mortgage debt. How much are people saying that there's something similar going on here uh, versus a real beginning or at least entering at a good time for the M&A business? You know, it's a good question. And I asked the question to Mizuho, who's really the top executive here in the United States. I asked why $15 a share when they were trading at less than seven just Friday. And he said, listen, before the regional banks sell off, this is what they were trading at. We think this is a fair price. To defend the Japanese a right. little bit here, MUFG had also made that Morgan Stanley deal in 2008 that has paid off over and over and over again. <laughs> think just as recently as Elon Musk and Twitter. That put MUFG on the deal next to right. Morgan Stanley. And so the idea here is that they can win uh, if they buy cheaply here. Real quickly, we're out of time, but this will be a study much more through the day with your reporting in Bloom reports at Green Hill to be taken out by Mizuho. Rule number one, you got to keep the horses. How does Scott Bach and Mark Lasky keep the troops? Well, I think one thing they could do is buying more troops from Credit Suisse. So I think they have an opportunity here to add on more bankers at a oh, time. listen to you. She's, <laughs> she's like knee deep in it. I mean, you know. You know, I've covered Green Hill for a decade. And what's interesting is Mizuho actually used to have a stake in Evercore. Uh, so buying these banks is not easy. And to Tom's point here. You got to keep the, the bankers, troops. If you don't keep the troops, you don't have a bank. Yeah, it's just that simple. Shanali Basic, thank you so much for reporting this morning of Green Hill, taken out by uh, Mizuho. It's about a double. We'll get the share price up for you, but certainly far away from the excitement and enthusiasm of 2010. Futures advance from zero, even red on the screen, up five. The VIX 17.06. I'm watching a two-year-old. Wow. Basic walks in the studio. <laughs> we explode a 4.29%. Good morning. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. China has questioned the sincerity of the Biden administration as it pushes to resume high-level diplomatic talks with Beijing. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokeswoman saying, quote, the U.S. side asks for communication on the one side, yet on the other, suppresses and contains China by every possible means. President Biden says he expects ties with China to improve very shortly, dismissing an alleged spy balloon that caused a diplomatic spat earlier this year as, quote, silly. China is likely to see its COVID-19 wave peaking at about 65 million infections a week toward the end of June, according to a senior health advisor. Now, this comes as authorities rush to bolster their vaccine arsenal to target the latest Omicron variants. XBB has been fueling a resurgence in cages and cases across China since late April and is expected to result in 40 million infections a week by the end of May. General Motors' new president of North America, Rory Harvey, spoke to Bloomberg's Matt Miller about GM's new line of electric vehicles. 
We're absolutely all in in terms of uh, EVs as an example. You know, you know that Escalade has been sort of dominant and iconic in the uh, in the large SUV segment for, for over 20 years now. And uh, you know, if you looked at the, the current Escalade in terms of the ICE configuration, it's sort of segment leader. Uh, and if you then complement it with a, a ground up all new Escalade IQ, uh, it's absolutely fantastic news. GM says it will begin producing the Silverado EV pickup truck this month. You can watch Harvey's full interview with Bloomberg on the terminal. Global News powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo and this is Bloomberg. What we want to reduce is more like the build material cost, the industrial cost in the plants. So our cost we want to get out is actually in the heart of our industrial system. It's not like just people. You have said in the past you have 25% uh, more engineers working on the same output as your competitors. Does that mean you're going to reduce that 25%? Are you letting it happen through attrition? How's it working? I think you're going to see from Ford over, the, over many years uh, a natural reduction, not through attrition, but skill mismatch, intentional transition of our teams, moving some of the engineering to lower cost uh, labor sources. So it'll be a combination of things, um, but you know, it's, it's obvious that we, we, have, we have to be more efficient. James Farley's Ford is CEO speaking with our Matt Miller. We're going to go to Mr. Miller here in a moment out in Dearborn, uh, which is the land of Ford and all the changes they're doing, particularly in the EV uh, area as well. Right now, we got to turn to the markets up, too, but we have the bond markets moving. For those that have been waiting for Fed speak, and Lisa, I'm as guilty as anyone making jokes about the yawners. It is not a yawn by the gentleman from St. Louis this morning. James Bullard moves yield higher. He's speaking in a moderated discussion in Florida, saying that U.S. recession probabilities are overstated and expects to raise rates twice more <laughs> this year in order to get recession under control. He said the labor market is slowing some, but that does not mean recession. Again, the idea of two more rate hikes this year flies in the face of what a lot of people are either pricing in or uh, saying at the Federal Reserve. But to me, this is really the distinction that we keep hearing from Fed officials. If they think that things are too good, that is bad for markets because that means they're going to raise rates further to well, curtail some of the credit creation. Let's review this. And I, I do think this is important, folks. Bullard has been a collegial outlier agreeing with others that have been leading the charge, including the former New York Fed president, Bill Dudley, here. But a while back, he was giving scope and scale to a really significant reset in interest rates without any whisper of disinflation. I see a recapitulation of that this morning. Bullard saying inflation staying too high. One reason, one reason for more hikes, plural. And this We're is, very plural this morning. Well, and this is sort of the distinction between... <clears throat> the skipping of the June meeting or the pause, right? The skip being there might be more needed, as especially as you get data that's come out hotter than expected pretty much across the board. And what we see is, uh, well, a better economy, and that may include new cars, including new expensive cars from Dearborn. With a perspective on his world of autos, Matthew Miller joins us from Dearborn, Michigan, which can only mean Ford. Matt, I don't know if you brought it up, but the Ford family has enjoyed the Detroit Lions since 1934. Did you and Jim Farley talk about the resurrection of the NFL team from Dearborn? We did not. We focused pretty specifically on cars and uh, the business of making cars this morning. Well, the business of making cars is EV. You're knee deep in this. As a general statement, who in Detroit is winning the EV wards, Barra or Farley? Well, Farley uh, is winning the war as of now, right? Ford is the number two producer of electric vehicles in the United States. Um, only Tesla produces more, but Tesla produces and sells a heck of a lot more. So what they want to do is kind of narrow that gap and get closer to overtaking Tesla. They want to put out 2 million EVs by 2026 with, very importantly, a margin of about 8%. 
So the, the sort of distinction right now between uh, a lot of the EV producers <clears throat> and, frankly, between the Detroit Lions of GM and Ford is that GM said that they didn't think that they had to cut prices in response to Tesla's price cuts, but Ford did. Why? Do they not have that pricing power? No. Uh, well, Ford, it, that's, you're right in pointing out that distinction, and it's stark. I should say. Um, Jim Farley is, I think, very realistic in his expectation that once production comes back online to the levels that we've previously seen, you know, we were running at a 17 million SAR in 2019, and now 15 million is like the top. So once we get back to that previous level, you're going to see so much more competition in this space that price cuts are going to be a thing of necessity. Yeah. They're going to have to do it, according to Farley, and GM will have to capitulate as well. This is a really important story from a macro perspective as well, which is that essentially autos have driven some of the inflation that we've seen. And if you start to see the opposite, well, that will flip things on their head. How much is this a Ford story and how much is this an industry-wide story? The inflation is definitely an industry-wide story, but Ford has its own uh, unique piece of this in that they pay a lot more to make their cars than their competitors. Um, Jim Farley has identified, I think, six to seven billion dollars of what he calls cost disadvantages versus his competitors. So they're really working on pulling those out of production. And that's an ICE story, right? That's an internal combustion engine story more than an electric story because electric car production, they're starting now and they can nip those costs in the bud before they form. In terms of the ICE uh, uh, story, you know, they haven't built a new factory in 50 years. Right. So they really have to go back and look at everything in Matt, order to get those costs out. Matt Miller with us in Dearborn. We're going to go to some breaking news and come back to Mr. Miller here. This is, of course, AIDS. i got to be careful here. This is not the president sleeping after a long trip back from Japan. It is not the Speaker of House beginning his morning. This is McCarthy aide commenting on negotiators arriving soon at the Capitol. The soon here well, is the news. 9.15 a.m. is the time. <clears throat> What's interesting is we haven't really gotten a concrete time, or at least not one that I've received, as to when McCarthy and Biden yeah. will meet themselves. Negotiators, though, are arriving ahead of that, presumably uh, in the next <clears throat> perhaps uh, 20 minutes right. to get some sort of start on these uh, discussions. So we'll continue to monitor that into the 9 o'clock hour. Matt Miller, I'm absolutely fascinated by how people in Detroit, in the Matt Miller auto world, never bring up shareholder return. I look at the 10-year returns of the auto companies, and they're just flat out unacceptable. In your conversation with Jim Farley today, is there any discussion about how to drive shareholder return? Well, that's exactly what uh, Farley and the whole team are doing right now behind me. They're talking to investors. They're talking to analysts about how they can boost that over the next few years. And frankly, they see a different world post-IVE than pre-IVE because um, – you know, it won't be about the vehicles, Farley has said. It's not about the shell of the car that's going to make them money. In fact, you could see margins come down on the actual vehicle sales. It's really about the software and services. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where they see their growth coming in. And they have right. an example in Ford Pro, which is their, um, their commercial arm in terms of serving, you know, plumbers and electricians uh, across the country. The, the profit there has been a level that's uh, exponentially higher than what you get in car making. And they want to turn the whole business that way so they can boost shareholder returns. Matt Miller, thank you. From Dearborn, his conversation with Farley of Ford uh, Motor. Futures up two. That's really not the story with red and green on the screen. Lisa, I'm sorry. It's about a yield giveaway. The 10-year yield, three basis points higher. We have, uh, well, no, I, no, we do not have further curve inversion, but still set at 61 basis points shows attention Friday and today. And, and the real yield to me is important. 1.45%. There's just a higher rate regime here off of the Bullard comments. Two-year yields are the highest, about the highest, going back <clears throat> uh, about two months. So that's where we're at as we reset in this churn. If the market believes the Fed that they are not going to cut rates or need to cut rates, how much does that tighten credit conditions without the Fed doing anything different from what they've already said they're going to do? What if they don't 
really hike rates at all further for the rest of this year, but they just don't mm -hmm. cut. That will tighten, given the fact that people are still pricing in two cuts by year end. And I'm waiting for the disinflation path from the gentleman from Indiana University. He says we have a good shot at getting back to 2% inflation. So there's the round trip from two rate hikes up, as he alludes to, no recession in sight. You know, he hedges that. I'm being a little too strong there. I love this. Households are flush. Did you feel that way this weekend? How, <laughs> well, how about those summer camps? You know, yeah, exactly. Hey, Households you without kids know, might be flush. Ones think, with them never has, are. Has Jim Bullard ever got the summer camp supplies email <laughs> and then you're flush? The packing list? You know, Dr. Bullard, I'm, the packing list. and bring. Oh, we yeah. want you to bring a few things with you. Yeah, I want you to bring 25 shirts and 55 socks. Exactly. I mean, honestly, the one thing that I think is important to note that is he's not a voting member. Right. So how much do we give more weight to certain members than others? This is an active discussion. They are trying to signal something to them to the market, perhaps more than following through with this type of action. I, I've never put much weight in that. And, and, and Mike McKee does. He puts a lot more weight in it than I do. I'm just looking at who they are, what they believe in. And, and James Bullard has made very clear he has an optimism about American economic growth that doesn't get you to the gloom of recession. It's been a fascinating Monday. I don't know what else to say about it. Congratulations to our chief financial correspondent, Shanali Basak, reporting on Green Hill, taken out by Mizuho. We move forward. Good morning.